This episode is made possible by our generous patrons. Episode 105 of the Ink to Film podcast, where we read the book and then see the movie. I'm James. And I'm Luke. And this week we discuss Andy Muccietti's 2019 film, It Chapter 2. Okay, so here we are, 27 years later from when we first started <laughs> this podcast. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm so much older. I, I now throw up every time I, right before I start recording. Uh, <laughs> just the thought of recording an it related episode yeah yeah it's our eighth eighth it episode you realize that we've done eight on this one this one project it's wild i mean it's two films and a massive novel and a mini series so there's a lot to cover there yeah and i feel like it, maybe that's part of the why i'm so connected to it and you've talked about it before how it's such a weird project to be this yeah. nostalgic and this connected to because it is like <laughs> dark and and uh, I think scary to a lot of people in a lot of ways. Yeah. But like to, to me, it's this sort of like home home feeling. Like it's like it's like this <laughs> yeah. like safe territory that I know so well. It's all wrapped up in our memories of starting the podcast and the initial excitement and in the you know learning on the fly and all of that is bound up in this for us. So in some ways, it's going to be tough to be objective about about this movie and about this whole project. But I'm going to try. Yeah, I think so. I think so as well. Um, and there's something there's something that I felt as the as the film got more and more successful after that opening weekend and everyone talked about it. And it brought about like this new surge of like R rated horror films that weren't necessarily like gross out gore necessarily. They yeah. were more like, I don't know, it was like this, there was definitely this huge push. And we've seen like, box offices reflect that um, based on like people going to see R rated f- films now. Um, like specifically horror and so just like as as it went along I felt like a connection to it as it as it was successful and I was like look at that it's like I, I yeah. felt like a certain like connection to it um, so it's it's really wild to be back here two years later and like be covering the end and this this will be like probably the last it related thing we ever uh barring one specific thing this might be the last <laughs> it related episode we ever have in the in the main feed yeah um e- even that specific thing I think you're gonna mention uh that might end up being a bonus episode. I don't know. We're undecided. Maybe we'll do a main episode on it. I'm not sure. But yeah, I mean, it probably will be. It's bittersweet to think of that. Um, like I, like we said, I'm full of nostalgia for this project. And, you know, it, it is a weird project for that to be it because of the because of it being creepy and, and disturbing. But it's also kind of appropriate in a, in a way because of how much it's about memory and at this point where we are with the podcast, like looking back and remembering our childhood selves <laughs> from two years ago, um, I don't know, it's kind of fun in that sense. And, um, you know, talking about how we've grown and how we've changed and I don't know, all that's interesting to me and, and seems kind of thematically relevant to this project. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we've grown like, I mean, professionally, personally, I feel like <laughs> I've grown so much. And so, uh, yeah. To be back here is just such a such a wild thing, but I want to ask you because I I know we were like the, we were at an all time high as far as hype for a project with this because this yeah. has been something that's been in our back pockets for years now. We've been waiting for yeah. this movie to come out, and we always knew we would cover it because of how how impactful the first one was for us. So with that being said, I wanted to know because I, I'm pretty sure you went to see this in IMAX, right? I want to know your viewing experience because I. I had a kind of interesting one as well. Okay, yeah, I did go see it in IMAX. I saw it on a Sunday night, so I think I had missed all of the like major crowds. Um, it was even like you know it went because it's a long movie. It went to like eleven o'clock, so uh, the theater probably only had I don't know thirty people in it at most, um, which is decent, but for a massive IMAX theater, not that many. Um, so yeah, I, I am curious. Like, were you able to see it in a? And did you have like a full theater? Because I think that might would have been really fun. So yeah, I did have a full theater. Um, I was actually in Gainesville, and I was com- going to be coming back, but I was like, I got want to see this movie right now. And I mm-hmm. they have they opened up a theater there that has a Regal Premium Experience theater. Have you ever heard of these before? No. 
So basically, it's like um, they're trying to give you the best possible presentation without it being IMAX. So, okay. um, you know, the seats are very nice. They're like the reclining seats that you see all over the place now. But specifically, the projection quality and the sound quality, as well as, and I've done 40X, 40X experiences before where they move mm-hmm. you around and they blow smells at you and rain <laughs> falls on you and that kind of thing. Uh-huh. So it wasn't that, but it, yeah. there was like a certain vibration to the chair as like things, oh. as like scary things would happen. So it was almost like a rumble pack for like an N64 controller on my yeah, chair, right. uh-huh. uh, which I found to be actually pretty nice. And like, I do think that there's something, there's like a nice novelty to a 4DX experience. This, I thought that was, this was really fun. And the sound is really what sold me on this experience. Um, yeah. It was amazing. It was just like the, it was some of the best sound I've heard in a theater in a long time. And nice. for this movie, it, it, I think it added like a lot. That's one of my favorite things about IMAX, honestly. I love that IMAX sound. It's yeah. so good. And you know, obviously the screen is great too. But I, I'm definitely a 2D, IMAX 2D proponent. I'm not big on the IMAX 3D. Um, so whenever I can see a movie in that format, I'll, I'll dish out a little extra to go to go see it. Uh, I wish it wasn't so expensive, but you know, that's yeah. what it is what it is. It is what it is. Um, but my, yeah. my theater was packed as well. Um, it okay, was like so how, how were people, a... were, were they reacting in, in fun ways? They were, yeah. At first, um, God, I'm so hypersensitive in theaters. So like at first, the people in front of me were like whispering about the first movie and stuff. And I'm like, I just, ah. Oh. <laughs> like, like maybe five minutes in, they stopped. And uh, Should have just leaned in and said, listen to the Ink to Film podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Catch up. <laughs> yeah, so so that was that was really the only thing, and then from there, the only audience participation I really had was like people, people like I could feel people's reactions and and see them in the theater, people jumping, people people yeah. making noises and stuff. So, like uh, out of fear, but uh, ha- so I mean, we've talked about the experience. I, I really enjoyed my experience. Uh, let's talk yeah. about the f- the film itself. We're going to talk about non spoilers first, um, just in case people haven't seen it yet and you're interested to hear our thoughts on it. I had somebody ask me an interesting question, um, and I'll pose it to you. So uh, I was at my write-in that I go to on Monday nights, and somebody asked me, they're like, oh, should I see? Should I go see a chapter two? Was it good? And I was like, yeah, I, th- I think you probably should. I don't know. I said, um, I said, did you like the first one? And they said, eh, it was okay. Do you think I should see the second one? And I was like, hmm. So I, I don't know. That's an interesting question. What do-, what do you think? If someone had that reaction to the first one, do you think the second one's going to change their opinion of it? Are they going to, are, or is it worth coming back to to give it another shot? So there's a couple, I think, stipulations for these movies because I remember when this film came out, I was really excited about it. I was really happy about it, um, but I think people put a lot on it before before going to see it, and then once they saw it, I think they were let down by what the movie was actually about. Are you talking about? Um, are you talking about book fans, or are you talking about? people maybe maybe who saw the miniseries else. people who were like interested and like understood who it was and like what it represented the scary clown but maybe hadn't read the book so they weren't mm-hmm. necessarily like really steeped in in the what the what the story is about so uh I, I remember that that being a reaction people saying like oh it's not that good it wasn't that good um but i i know i mean i mean we know how we felt about it i i really enjoyed yeah. it and then this one's having a very interesting reaction i think with general audiences as well because it's um Part of the appeal to, I think, these films is the, is the children and then having yes. it be the adults, I think, is a harder sell maybe for people, especially if they were like, oh, it was just OK for the first one. Now, I'm selfishly going to say, like, just go see it and enjoy it and have the experience to somebody who says, should I go see it? But if they're like, yeah. oh, I didn't really like the first one or they're like, it was OK, then I would say, like, I think you're probably going to feel about the same way about this sequel. And th- that's what I ended up saying. I don't think we should call it a sequel because it's not. It's actually like the second part you know what i mean yeah yeah it's the rest it's it's the other half of the book but it's not even right. that it's the rest of the book right i worry that people are like oh a sequel and it's like kind of has a different connotation to like yeah. the, the conclusion to the story so i think uh that is actually probably another thing factoring into the reaction of this because i think there's a lot of younger people who didn't see the miniseries didn't read the book saw chapter one enjoyed it and were excited to go see chapter two and maybe didn't realize just how much it was going to focus on the adults and we're kind of hoping for a lot more of the kids you know and right. i can see like if you're a big fan of those kids like there is some stuff in in this movie for you absolutely but there's not nearly the same that you got in chapter 1 so if that's why you went back for chapter 2 you're going to be kind of disappointed i don't know how you see a trailer and don't know that but but i, I don't know people have expectations that you know are do, doing different things in their heads and that's just how it goes 
Well, I actually, I, I wanted to give Muschietti credit for the fact that he did, I think, do a pretty, because I, I feel like the first film was very, there were no adult uh, versions of the kids. And I feel like the yeah. second part here, he made, he made good on what the book kind of what the book's premise was was the cutting back and forth between the two right. and i felt that that was a lot of fun that he was able to add those kids back in and have and have as much of them as he had because i was actually expecting almost no kids yeah um i so i think that we have to talk about the super cut that andy muschietti has has said that he is interested in doing right i i, I think you might have looked into this a little bit more what kind of information do you have um, because I'm, I think that's I'm, relatable. That's relating to what we're talking about. So I have tons, but I also have some that kind of have spoilers. So we'll talk about those later. Okay. So, so later. just to talk about it, he has said that he's working with a studio and they're, I, I think at this point we can almost guarantee that there's going to be a super cut. Now, mm-hmm. from what I understand, he's not looking to intercut the two films. They're kind of be they're going to kind of be just like put up against each other. But he has really? said there's additional footage. There's additional stuff that they have they have shot that he would add back into it. And also super crazy. He has two more scenes. He wants to go back and shoot. Right. So he, he wants to go put wow. additional footage into. the. I super wonder. Code. I wonder if those are uh, that, that it can't be like involving the entire cast. I can't imagine. So I don't know. I, I doubt it. I highly doubt that the, the Warner Brothers would be down for that. And the, the money, yeah. the ticket that that would cost. But uh, yeah, yeah, who knows? It's probably more like he might want to go back. Well, I don't know. I don't know. If, so has he confirmed he doesn't want to do it the same way where it's intercutting between the two? I, in an interview, he somebody asked him about it. And he, he said that he, he wanted to just put them up against each other and add the additional footage. Because I think what that would require is is tonally sitting back down with the film and, and going through an edit for the next six months to a year and like really yeah. trying to figure out exactly what he wants out of it. And I because he said that like um, he's not interested in doing like what Godfather did with their supercut and like inter- intercutting it and putting it like cutting it all up and kind of reshuffling it. Hmm. Now, that's interesting because I, I think that I would that's the version I would be most excited to see Me and too. thoughtfully put together by the director um, and that being and that and that brings me back to why I brought this all up here before we got through with spoilers. The question came up: What is the format of this story that works best for it? Is it what we got in the books, or is it what we got in the films? I'm gonna pose that to you. I mean, look, if you're just talking on a straight up like story standpoint, and you're gonna talk yes. about like what pulled it off better, it's got to be the book. But I think that it's it's just they're di- completely different animals, completely different beasts. Um, yeah, I think that they did such a great job with part one and part two here, and they made good on so much of what the the book wanted and what it called for. And they they I think maybe to an excess sometimes did almost everything they possibly could have to to represent what was on the page. Okay, I'll be interested to hear some specifics on that. Um, yeah, I have more thoughts on the supercut, but I, I'm I'm realizing we should probably move on just because people probably want to hear more about this film in particular. Really quickly, if you can tell me what, what like what kind of format you prefer, if 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 you want to just give an answer and then we can talk more yeah. about it later. It's the book, um, and and the reason being, I I don't know. There's a lot of reasons, but one of the main ones is that like we were just talking about, I I think the children are always going to be the most interesting part of this story um, yeah. because the innocence being faced with this evil uh, that is Pennywise. The re- the reason I say the book version is better is because it takes the children's story and it spreads it out through the entire novel in a way that makes the adults work even better because you're constantly being reminded that this character is this character. And y- y- so they almost blend into each other more uh, seamlessly than you get in the films. Um, but like you said, it's a different form. Um, I don't think it would have worked as two films that way. Like you had to do it kind of this way to make it two separate films. Um, but that's why I was saying I would be interested in a supercut that it attempted something more akin to the format of the novel. Um, so we'll see if that comes to pass. What I will say about the, the last thing I'll say about this for now is that uh, whether Andy Muschietti does the the cutting up and kind of the, the whether or not he does that officially with the studio, somebody will do it eventually. And um, mm. who knows if WB will like sign off on it and say like, yeah, that's a good point. But OK, so let's talk about this movie um, in general terms. Uh, I guess the easiest place to start with, because we've already kind of talked about like if we would recommend it to people. Um, yeah. What, what like so how, how do you compare the two films? Like how, how did you feel about this one in comparison to the first one? It was it, this is a good movie. And I 
in my opinion, and I enjoyed it. Um, like we said, I, it's tough for me to be objective about this project. Um, I think the the adults were were mostly good all around. I think uh, they they played off of their children counterparts well. But there's a little, there's just like a little bit of that Goonies sort of like, in, like I said, the children magic that you had in the first movie, um, that just isn't quite there with the adults. And, and and I don't think there's anything you can do about that. I think that's just how it is with adults. And yeah. it, nothing you can do will stop the fact that seeing a bunch of like thirty year old, thirty five year old adults, forty year old, however old they are, <laughs> um, adults reacting to a scary clown is never going to be the same as seeing children do it. Right. Um, it's just inherently it's, different things. It's yeah. just inherently different and I think more effective for it to be children. Um, so that is one of the things that I think the movie suffers from overall, but it doesn't matter to me because I can kind of see it holistically as like a part two of part one and think of it all as one story because I read the book. And so I think if you go in with that mindset, you're you're maybe going to be able to look past it a little more and, and really enjoy this movie. Yeah. And I think that's the main thing is if you're a fan of the book, th that's who they made these films for is the people who, who understand the entire story. And like it's going to seem overly really, really, really long to people who are not that familiar. And they're going to yeah. wonder why these, some specific scenes are in there that, that seem to drag and that seem to go on forever. But it's all there for like the atmosphere and the idea of dairy and setting these characters up and showing where they because you know what Muchietti had to do in this sequel or this part two is introduce an entire new cast, which and you yeah. were saying like it's it's harder. You're never going to get the same magic. These are phenomenal actors and they did a phenomenal job, period, like all the way across yeah. the board. I feel like all of these adult actors were perfectly cast um, by us, I might say. <laughs> yeah i think we, we, we asked a couple, couple of these <laughs> which was which was really funny uh and that was another thing just as as news was coming out and everything was gearing up for for chapter two we always felt that connection i was like bill Hader, bill Hader is gonna be richie that's so perfect yeah so uh and he was a standout in this movie oh uh, absolutely I, I my favorite part easily um with maybe jessica chastain being right there with him but he yeah. he like was the heart of this movie uh the comedy of the movie he killed it all the way through uh, I wanted to really quickly say, I, I agree with you. I think that that it was it was. I, I didn't. I don't think that I ever thought going into this film that it was going to be better than the first one. I thought that it was it was right. going to be of the same quality, um, which I feel like for the most part we did get. I think that I, I in some ways, like I've said, I think that it didn't quite hit the same the same kind of nerve that the first one did. But it, I, I I thoroughly enjoyed myself, and it was mm. it was a fun movie i'm gonna watch it again and i actually like I, I in my research and just seeing what people have been saying about the movie i tend to disagree with like a lot of a lot of critics on this and it's and i think it's because like we've said we're really biased at this point and close to the project but like i said if you if you have read that book like it's it's like the representation of the book is right there on screen now and you can tell that like Muccietti loved the book to the point that he was like i'm gonna give all book readers what they wanted and I think there's a reason why Stephen King signed off on this movie. You know, like you, right. you've heard him say a lot that he like really enjoyed the first one. And you can tell that that it, it stayed true to his message throughout. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to push back just a little bit. And, and it's honestly more just playing devil's advocate. It's not really something I feel. Um, but I've seen I've seen some like I actually have been trying to stay away from criticism as much as possible to, to keep myself sort of like unaffected by it. Mm -hmm. um, but I've managed to see some of it. And uh, I think it is some people who read the book when they were kids. And a lot of people did that. You know, like we talked about earlier, like when we, when I was a kid, I remember hearing about it in hushed tones. And like it was this thing that was so scary as a book to like that you would dare to read it. And then you you coupled that with the miniseries that if you didn't read the book, a lot of people saw that miniseries as children and it scared the shit out of them. And they have this like super um, fond memory of Tim Curry as Pennywise. And some of those people, I think when they see this are not going to be able to separate that experience from what they're seeing now in the, in the way that nostalgia kind of fucks with us. Mm -hmm. And, and I think they're going to look back on the miniseries, which we just covered and I think a lot of people look back at that rose-colored rose glasses, you know, and think it was this great thing. But, like, if you watch it today, I'm <laughs> sorry to tell you, it doesn't really hold up that well. And 
Um, I think also if you experienced the novel and it was like one of your first horror novels you ever read and it was like one of your first ex- ex- um, terrifying experiences of reading a book, um, this movie you're going to see as an adult and you're going to go, ah, oh, this doesn't quite capture my memory of the book. You know what I mean? It's kind of that weird like 27 year distance of Pennywise of like the things that we change in our memories and how it, it distorts over time and I'm not saying you're wrong. Um, I I just feel like uh, both of us are more recent comers to the novel, and because of that, I don't think my 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 feelings around the novel are not bound up in this sort of like childhood nostalgia that I think a lot of people have, and so I, that might affect your viewing of it. Because I've seen some people saying like, "Oh, this isn't my it. This this isn't right. you know the one that I that I grew no. up with." No, and I totally understand that as a viewer and like 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 there are things that I'm nostalgic for, but I think that there's something that you have to be willing to take a step back and identify objectively what you prefer as a film. And so if yeah. you're like, "Oh, the Tim Curry performance was amazing for the time period." Absolutely. You're not, there's nothing yeah. there's absolutely nothing wrong with saying that. I think that's 100% true. But if you're trying to tell me that that objectively that's a better film, I would I would just have to disagree. You know what I mean? Like it's just like yeah. I I think that the nostalgia like you said can can blind people, but like you have to t- I can I'm willing to take step steps back and say like this objectively isn't that good, but I love it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, this movie or are you talking about No, no, no. In general, I'm willing to take a step back and and like look at things that I'm very nostalgic for and say like, oh, this this objectively like this film isn't really that good as a film, but I have so much nostalgic for it and it's so wrapped up in my childhood that I love it. Yeah. And so part of this is also the adaptation problem um, that we we've dealt with throughout this podcast, and that's that a book has to change. And as much as you've been talking about it being um, a pretty accurate or pretty faithful there was definitely changes. There was omissions. There, you know, uh, the form is different. And if you are a super fan of this novel, um, you might you might push back on some of the changes that happened, and you might push back on certain scenes that were omitted. And uh, the is as is, is R rated as this film is, it's not as brutal. It's not as dark, and it's not as gross at times. And and um, there's like a there's a real griminess to that novel that when you read it, it will just affect you because it's uh, King like really takes an unflinching look at a lot of really dark shit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, while you get a taste of some of that in the film, they definitely don't go quite as far. Um, right. They're definitely farther than the miniseries, which was completely sanitized of that. But still, it's not quite the same. And if, if you're really attached to that stuff and you think that that's what makes the novel a brilliant you maybe you'll miss some of that too. Now, I'm not talking about the Beverly, the, the infamous Beverly scene. That is sort of its whole different animal that we discussed at length in our fifth episode. Um, so if you want to hear our thoughts on that, go back to that. We're not going to rehash it here, but I'm talking more holistically throughout the entire novel. There was a lot of this like really dark childhood stuff that that uh, comes up that that is very important to I think metaphorically what Pennywise represents for the story, which is childhood trauma. Right. And the more effectively you show childhood trauma, the more effective Pennywise can step in as the metaphorical monster that has to be bested by the adults. Right, which is why I'm willing to like the the book is the adapta- is is the representation I think of what I think it's the better representation of of the messages that are being set up and the messages that go along with the story. So objectively, I can look at the the book and say that. But in terms of the film. I think that these films really captured, like I've said, the message of what of what the book was get going at. You know, yeah. re- regardless of the fact that things are changed, there's always something that's changed. They can't fit everything in. But right. I don't think that they ever, in my opinion, I don't think they ever took a turn that was completely in the opposite direction from the book. And I, to me, that that's a good representation of a, of a faithful adaptation for a book reader. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. But uh, I wanted to move on to a couple other things. The use of practical effects in, in this... I feel like we've always talked about it on the podcast. Any time that you can use practical effects in order to achieve anything in camera, I just feel yeah. like it's it's always notable and it's worth looking at. There's a great blend of practical and augment and practical that's been augmented by CG and just straight world class CG in this film. Um, mm. I, I, so many things stand out to me, but there is some things that are so good that you might even have missed them. Um, have you seen any headlines? Did you realize at all that a lot of the children were, were digitally de-aged throughout the entire film? Oh, wow. I was wondering because a lot of them, uh, it looked like they must, I was like, oh, he must've shot these scenes 
during chapter one because they don't look much older. Right. Um, there was a couple of times where I was like, okay, maybe this one was shot later. That kid looks like a little bit older. But mm-hmm. yeah, that's interesting if they de-aged him because, because that would create that effect. Yeah, for sure. It's crazy because most of it was not shot at the same time as chapter one. Wow. Yeah. So some wow. of the char- some of the actors didn't change all that much in the in the you know two years between these shoots. Um, m- notably, um, Sophia Lillis and also Chosen Jacobs, who played Beverly and Mike, were two that like stayed relatively the same looking. There were some some adjustments mm-hmm. made, but people like Finn Wolfhard or Jack Dylan Grazer. If you look at them, if you look at them in the first film, it just I mean, just for Finn Wolfhard, if you if you think of yeah. season one of Stranger Things and you look at him in season two or three, you see yeah. how much change he's gone through. And they had yeah, to sure. de-age him back down to look like he looked in, in it. Chapter one. He was one, yeah. I think he, I've heard that he was the one that they had to work the hardest to de-age. Yeah, it, that's interesting. But, and and it, it pulled it off because he was the one that I was looking for most. I was like, he's going to look way different now. Yeah, um, it would have been it would have been silly if he'd been standing there, you know, two feet taller, <laughs> um, acting like he was had an age. But they, they they did a good job with that. Wow. Jack Dylan Grazer, um, his voice changed to such a, a drastic degree. That which, they ones, almost, which one's he? That would be uh, Eddie. Okay. So in the first film, he's like very small and he's the inhaler and everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he's always talking about like, you know, gazebos, gazebos. and bullshit. Uh-huh. And <laughs> so uh, he changed so drastically, they almost had to hire a uh, a new voice actor to dub over his lines so that it would sound similar because his voice changed so much in that time. Wow. So before we move on to spoilers, I just want to get I think I think it's worth talking about Pennywise. Right. And uh, the performances the the, you know, Tim Curry versus Skarsgård. And and what Skarsgård brings here to the role, and in a non-spoiler way, um, we talked about it a little bit last episode, but I want to touch on it again here. And to me, that is, uh, th- there's a physicality to his performance. There is a movement, and then um, the the whole eye thing that he does that you know famously is not CGI that he can really do that stuff. And then the drool is so gross and mm-hmm. it's like i picked up on it, it you know more and more as i've watched these films how he just lets himself salivate during these scenes and it's that's like terrifying like i don't know like the it really conveys the hunger of it and it can and it conveys sort of the unhinged nature and um once again i I think he steals scenes that he's in. I th- he's captivating. You can't stop watching him whenever he's on. Whenever he's on screen, you're just waiting to see what Pennywise is going to do, which makes this villain, a, a, I think, an iconic one, and and something we're all going to be remembering for a long time when we talk about just like unhinged performances, right? Like this has got to be one of the most memorable ones we've seen in, in modern times. Yeah, he's horrifying, and I was listening to something that was kind of talking about his approach to the character, um, in the way that you can kind of see Tim Curry's playing a crazy clown. Uh, Bill Skarsgård is, is he approached the character as, as a God or like some sort of being beyond this world. That's, that's acting as if it's a clown. And, and like, I think that he brought a lot to that role in that way. Um, I'm just thinking of like in this film, the, the scene under the bleachers is just like, it blows yeah, me away. I don't know if we want I don't, is that a spoiler to get into? It, I think it's kind of in the trailer. It's kind of a spoiler, I think, but it's just... Okay, let's, it let's save it, because I want to talk about that scene, too, but let's save it. Yeah. So, in the first film, we had the scene uh, in the sewer, the original, like, Georgie scene. Immediately yeah. sells me on Pennywise, and I think that that's just a great representation of, like, how he's creepy while also being, like, not of this world, and, and then ultimately, like, what all happens with Georgie and the way that they pulled that off, and that I think is just a good representation of going forward, Bill Skarsgård just continued that performance and maybe brought even more to it this time um you're talking about the physicality he apparently does like most of his own stunts within this film so he's doing a lot of like falling like all that like falling and doing weird stuff with his body all that stuff like that's mostly him so he really uh he's like i've i've read that he was like constantly exhausted on set um an interesting little tidbit is that he in the first film uh Muccietti kept Skarsgård away from the other from the children the the rest of the cast basically and in this mm-hmm. one he didn't so he was actually able to hang out with Jessica Chastain Bill Hader all these people um uh Isaiah Mustafa like he got to like hang out with them in costume and Bill Hader has a bunch of great if you listen to any of the like the late night shows he's got some good interviews right now about like what it was like to hang out with Pennywise and 
And uh, Skarsgård didn't like try to stay in the role or anything. He wasn't like a right. He wasn't trying to be a method actor. He uh, would just like be hanging out, like showing film videos on his phone and things like that to to mm-hmm. people, and it was just really funny. So, <laughs> from all accounts, nice. he's nothing like Pennywise. <laughs> he seems like a great guy. Did you see the interview? Um, I thought it was interesting um, where he was talking about how after shooting the original it, he had all these like nightmares about Pennywise. Are you, are you Bill Skarsgård said this because I think I think um, J- James McAvoy also had something similar where he would like before filming started like he was having he has like one very specific dream that I heard about where he was like in bed with with Pennywise and Pennywise was like stroking his back. Oh really? No, I did not hear that. <laughs> yeah. No the 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 Skarsgård dreams were interesting because it was he said they were like they come in two varieties. It was one where he would be watching Pennywise or Pennywise would come and, 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 and scare him or, 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 or that. But then the other dream is that he is Pennywise and he was like doing horrible things. And, um, he, he almost felt like he was like kind of haunted by it. And that was after chapter one. And then, and then he had to come back and, and, and he said that it was kind of nice to, to eventually move past it. And the dream st- stopped happening so much. And then he had to obviously get back into that headspace for chapter two. So I'm going to be curious to see if, if he, there's any of that again, now that he's had to do it again. So he actually to speak to that a little bit. I guess he was a little worried that being out of the Pennywise role for so long, like he had, he had, you know, really immersed himself in the role for the first film. And then he was out of right. it for a while. And then he was worried coming back into the second one, if he could bring the same, the same character and like still channel him and he said that like as he began to try to it came back immediately and it was like right there ready to go so and and that that's something i I don't think there's any drop off between the two i think we actually it feels to me like we get more pennywise in Mm -hmm. chapter two than we got in chapter one i don't know if that's true screen time wise but it might be um and yeah i think he's he's every bit as good as he is in the first one in my opinion as far as like his performance of pennywise yeah so uh, one more thing I wanted to talk about with the de-aging process that that uh, I just remembered I wanted to speak about is uh, we've seen a lot of this de-aging recently with um, with like the Marvel movies. You'll see an older sure. actor and they de-age and they kind of take away some of the wrinkles, tighten up the skin, make them look like. And there's plenty of films for them to go off of in order to, you know, for someone like Samuel Jackson to de-age him. They can just look back yeah. at his films. Um and they kind of had something similar with it chapter one with the children like they had a goal of how they wanted them to look once they were de-aged but this process in it's kind of never been done before because it's it's not taking somebody and making like making them look younger based on like wrinkles or anything like that you're actually taking somebody and reversing puberty which i feel might even be (laughs) harder because you're having to take someone who's changed in a way that's not like they they can look completely different sometimes you know like puberty can change people in that way so this the the work that must have gone their on their skeletal with, structure has changed yeah everything and like just <laughs> yeah. like like taking somebody on screen and like manipulating that must have just been an absolute like incredible feat and i've heard that Muccietti was like constantly like daily on the phone um like seeing seeing how the progression was going of, of all these processes and his cg and everything so just really fascinating stuff yeah. and like it's like pushing pushing the boundaries of what i even thought was possible and i yeah. i feel like there's gonna be a large percentage of people who see this who did, do not realize that they were de-aged yeah and that's I, I mean i'm one of them i didn't realize that i thought that they had shot it all like a lot of those scenes before or they just did it with camera tricks i didn't realize it was cgi so that's the that's the hallmark of great cgi that we're going to start moving into more and more as as it improves is um the the kind you can't see if it's invisible, that's that's the ideal CGI, you yeah, know. Definitely. Uh, but I I think we got to get into spoilers at this point, man. I got I got stuff I want to talk about that that un- unfortunately I can't at this point. Um, do you have any other non spoiler thoughts on this film? My the last thing I really want to say is just that if you've if you've read the book and you've seen the first movie. I guarantee you get something out of the second movie um, yeah. to anybody who's wondering if they should check all of this out. I highly recommend the book. I know that it's a thousand something pages, but it was it's it's a journey and it's and it's one that I hold really near and dear to my heart. So I'm really excited to, to uh, for people to see this and, and to hear how, how everybody feels about it. Me too. And, and, and I do feel like this. I mean, as much as the first movie was 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 uh I, I remember it wasn't universally loved it seemed like a lot of people really liked it but there was definitely critics um i, I just think that's gonna be even more so for this one you're gonna have extreme reactions in both directions um it's definitely gonna be an interesting to talk about oh you know what's non-spoilers we could talk about how did this movie do in the box office 
I'm curious. That's a great question. So um, <laughs> based on what I was seeing, the film had a budget, which was double the first. So the, the film had a budget Ooh. of like 70 million. Now, okay. I feel like that's probably in large part to the, the star studded cast that they got together. Because yeah. those... And de-aging all the children. <laughs> <Quite Yeah. expensive. laughs> yeah, definitely. As far as I saw for opening weekend domestically, it made 90 million. So okay, in so. terms of worldwide box office, when you when you add what, however much that's going to end up being, it's I, there's no doubt in my mind that it, it's like it's absolutely doing a great, great job. I think I, I saw it. How does that compare to chapter one opening weekend? Great question. I was about to bring that up. <laughs> so <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the three day totals. No, no, no. Worries. Uh, the three day totals for this film, uh, which was the opening weekend, was ninety one million dollars. And the three day totals for it. Chapter one was one hundred and twenty three million dollars. Okay, so it didn't eclipse. It did not eclipse. Um, okay. And I think that a lot of people thought that it might do cl- more, maybe like closer to 100 million or 110 million, but it just didn't mm-hmm. um, It just didn't do it for some reason. And I think that there are, there are a couple other metrics to measure how a film is doing, like actual tickets sold is something that I feel like people don't talk about enough because people want to talk about the money. Um, as far as tickets right. sold... I believe that these two R-rated films are in like the top. The first one is like the top three or four of all time. The op- this is only opening weekend, and then uh, it chapter two was like somewhere around twelve, in terms of like all R-rated films opening weekends of all time. And so these are absolute juggernaut films. And and to even think of it chapter two being like a less of a success at ninety one million for opening weekend is just like no, they absolutely killed it. Um, I think a lot of those return customers from It Chapter One just helped this film. It'll be interesting to see the legs to see if it continues on, but I I think that this is a bona fide hit at this point. Yeah, sounds like it. All right, man. Uh, Let's let's move on to spoilers. I'm ready if you're ready. Let's do it. Uh, I'm going to move chronologically for the most part. Some things may be slightly out of order, but I just am going to hit the scenes and we're going to talk through them. Okay. Before before we get started, though, I want to say I, I, I'm saving this for spoilers just in case we want to talk about any specifics. I kind of regret seeing so many trailers for this movie because because I felt like it kind of stole the thunder from scenes. Wow. And um, it makes me wonder if on this podcast, we might need to approach that differently going forward. <laughs> so much so, you know what I mean? Like, I'm wondering if I should avoid, like, it, when Dune comes out, should I just not watch trailers for it? Because it is affecting my reaction to the film somewhat. Because because that's the famous thing for trailers these days, is they ruin scenes. And, and yeah. they don't ruin them, they just they show it to you early, they spoil it. So that when it happens in the in the thing, you just instead of having the authentic reaction to what was in the film, I instead have a reaction to like, oh, yeah, that was in the trailer. And I hate that thought because it diminishes the scene. So I think I've said on the podcast, I only saw the trailer that we watched together. I think I saw the teaser and I saw the trailer that we watched together. Um, The trailer that we watched together, I think was did wasn't didn't have any spoilers that ruined anything for me. Um, And typically how I approach trailers and and just things in general it depends on the project depends on the property but um for the most part if it's something that i'm interested okay so if it's something i didn't know nothing about i'll watch the teaser because typically a trailer versus a teaser are two different things the teaser is not going to spoil much like there's a new teaser that's out for like the new christopher nolan film did you see that teaser yeah, yeah, that didn't that didn't reveal anything. <laughs> exactly. So, so that's they're worth watching teasers, but trailers when they when they start what they've started to do is put full scenes out as trailers. I'm against that completely. That's the one because yeah. in the teaser for this movie, it was Beverly talking to the old woman, and that whole exchange with the father, and then she comes running in out of the out of, and we didn't we didn't get the reveal of what of what she looked like. But that was the teaser. Yeah, I don't think I saw that one, though. You didn't see that one? Okay, no. so we watched the trailer, which was a little different. But the actual right. teaser, it has that full scene. That was the very first thing that was released for Chapter 2. Really? And it has almost almost in, in its entirety without yeah. the ending of it. And it just made it so that like the whole time I was watching that part, I was like, okay, yeah, this is all... I mean, there was like a couple bits here and there that have been edited out of, of, the, of the trailer. But um, it was mostly just all from the trailer. I don't know. There's a couple things like that. And then, and then a lot of the Pennywise scenes... Um, there's like cut, there's like parts of them in the trailer. Cause they love to show that stuff to like hook you. Right. You know, we saw the, we saw the balloons coming out from under the bridge. We see a lot of this kind of stuff and, and it just, it, it's cool. It is, is to see it in the trailer. You kind of go, ah, oh, well now it's kind of not as interesting to see it in the movie. Yeah. I don't know. Like you knew it was coming, I guess. 
Right. Um, th- there's the scene where the, uh, the the guy at the start is floating through the river, and you see Pennywise beckoning him to the right. to the to the side. Like that's mm-hmm. in the trailer, and like there's just certain things like that. Yeah. If it's a quick shot out of context, I don't mind it in a trailer. But if, like yeah. you're saying, if they're showing like extended, like basically parts in a scene, that's when it starts to bother me. Um, yeah. But yeah, like I understand, like seeing those moments for the first time, it's it's definitely a different experience, and and I I think it's probably a good good idea to to uh, start to avoid some stuff whenever possible for the podcast. There's a scene in the trailer where Pennywise hops out of a window, lands on a wall, and it looks like it's all gravity-defying and stuff, and it looks really cool. And I think he's above Mike Hanlon. I was looking at the, the image again, and I'm pretty sure that that scene is not in the film. Yeah, I remember you being um, excited about that shot in the, yeah, when we were talking I was all excited to see how it was going to look. It looked like a really cool moment. Yeah. Maybe that was the only cool part, and they just cut it for the trailer. You know, they took it for the trailer and then cut the scene for whatever reason, but... Yeah uh man i was sad to not see that in there and that's another thing that trailers can do and fuck with you is is if you get attached like a, that happened to me with like rogue one there's a bunch of really cool shit in that trailer that is not in the film <laughs> yeah um and it can fuck with you sometimes yeah definitely uh trailers are an interesting thing because there's a lot of times like the the trailer that we watched was nothing but a hype video for the film for me like it didn't feel yeah. spoiled and i was it was like the perfect they were taking old footage and like showing the new actors as the new characters and stuff i thought that was such a great trailer um so yeah. it, you know it's a double-edged sword i but, enjoyed the trailer don't get me wrong yeah. like, i love the experience of watching the trailer right it's super hypes me up for the movie it does the job it's meant to do it gets makes me want to go see it Mm-hmm. And I love what, like, I actually really like trailers. They're fun little, like, short films on this to watch um, just to get you hyped. But I can't deny the effect it sometimes has on the film itself when I'm sitting there watching it and I go, yeah, that was in the trailer, that was in the trailer. So right. anyway, it's just, yeah. it's a, it's got two sides to it. <laughs> All right. So moving into the plot here. Um, yeah. Like I said, it's going to be mostly in order, but we'll jump around a little bit. Um so we start off with something from the book, which is the murder of Adrian Mellon. Um, yeah. Controversial. Controversial in terms of the viewers or controversial, like in what way? I've seen people on Twitter talking about how like, hey, there's a hate crime at the start of this movie. So yeah. be aware, you know, like warning people who are going to see it. And and that's absolutely true. I mean, it's, it's very dark. Um, do you think the scene worked as it was presented in this movie as compared to how it is in the book? Was there any difference for you? I think it's better. I think it's better in the book. But I, I understanding that, yes, if, if you don't know going in, this could be a really like hurtful scene. Um, yeah. But I think it's also effective at, at selling Pennywise. You're kind of buying back into what Pennywise. It's like it's like the same idea of killing a child at the beginning of the first movie. We see a child get its arm ripped off. How old is that kid? Like under 10 years old yeah. and get dragged in like. Like, I, I know that it's 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 got different baggage and it's and it's different for sure. You know, I would have liked to have seen maybe the, the people who were because I think that's what a lot of audiences would think is the people who were attacking the gay men would be the ones that Pennywise would end up killing. But Pennywise isn't like that. He's ruthless and he doesn't care about yeah. anything. He, he's willing to, to take advantage. Well, and he of likes to pick who, off the weak. That's why he likes children. Right. So people who are injured, people who are like in a moment of crisis where they can't. Like it's, it's 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 yeah. a it's a scene from the book. So I don't think that I because I don't think that they brought anything that wasn't already in the book in terms of like them being a gay couple and having to deal yeah. with people who were who were, um, you know, being prejudiced against them. So in the other thing with with the with the film is that in the book, the hate crime is sort of already taking place. Yet, as we see so often in the book, there's something about Pennywise's influence that makes it worse and pushes characters to do worse things. And while you can read into the scene that, like, maybe that's happening, if you didn't read the book, you would have no reason to think that that's what's going on here, right? And and so that and that brings me around to another thing with the movie that I think doesn't quite come across, and that's the idea of a, an entire town that is under the influence of Pennywise and is sort of being haunted by Pennywise. Um, whereas in the movie, it feels a lot more like Pennywise is there, he's feeding on children, and picking off people and 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 that's still going on but for the most part the entire town isn't under his thumb yeah. but the the i always thought one of the most terrifying thoughts of pennywise is that his influence causes just like everyday evil in the town of Derry. yeah and, and and that's lost a little bit in this adaptation i agree um i think that it's implied so like if you read the book you can look for it and it's right. there but I don't think, like you're saying, it's outwardly. Like, if you're a viewer for the first time, you're probably not picking up on that. Yeah. You're just like, why is there a freaking hate crime in this movie? Like, it comes out of nowhere. It feels unrelated to Pennywise. 
Now, I don't remember if we talked about this or not, but in my research, I realized that um, Stephen King actually based this murder and or this hate crime and and the murder on real events. Did we have we talked about this before? I don't think we did. Okay, so so a very similar hate crime occurred where um, uh, his name is Charles O'Howard, and he and his boyfriend were walking down the street, and three teen- three teenagers harassed and assaulted him, um, yelling homophobic things at him, and eventually they 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 like got a hold of him and threw him over the bridge, and he was found dead. So uh, wow. I guess that it was something that that and it actually ha- happened in Bangor, Maine. So it was like okay, it was yeah. like close to King, and it was like something that he drew inspiration from, and. And uh, I just found that to be like really, really haunting and kind of uh, I, I don't know how to feel about that because it's like, is he is he slightly taking advantage of a, of a fucked up situation and using it for, for a horror moment and having Pennywise in there? Or is it kind of like in honor of this person? I think that that is. Yeah, I, I think the the former is kind of a jaded way to look at it. Sort of a I don't know, like. Like if you want to look at like all fiction as exploitative in certain ways, like, oh, you're going to look back on something horrible that happened to you or to somebody else and you're going to exploit it for the use of fiction to sell books. I think that's kind of a sad way to look at it. I think to me, it's more like this is the kind of evil that I see around me that I wish kind of had a supernatural reason. (laughs) And in Pennywise, as much as Pennywise is scary, it's also kind of gives the world an order to it because you think like, maybe that something like that could be pushed on by some supernatural entity that's that's almost beyond humanity. Um, and of course, the sad thing is it isn't true and that it is just terrible people. Um, but, you know, in the book, it's a, it's a monster that can be defeated. And so you get that sense of, and, the, and honestly, the end of this movie brings that around. Like, you can get the sense of, like, evil can be bested. And the, uh, much of Stephen King's work has that going for it where where that is the way he likes to end things which we have to talk about too <laughs> <laughs> oh we're gonna talk about um, that for sure yeah okay, uh, okay. <laughs> but uh, let's let's move chronologically towards it um we also early on get a get a scene from f- kind of from a different perspective of the first movie where young bev is is uh seeing into the deadlights and we get like an yeah. alternate scene where she's like she's kind of talking about how she's seen them as adults and they're the age of their parents and Stan asks like how he looks and she says like like the same but taller and we kind of realize that she's seeing something else. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that that's not something from the book. I don't I don't remember her having sort of visions of the future. Do you remember that? I don't remember. I don't think so. Because I, I, I don't think it really would have made sense in, in terms of like the chronological nature of the of the book. Yeah, she didn't have the whole deadlights thing. Right. Yeah. So that that is an interesting change. Um, it gives sort of a a fate feel to this, like oh, I've seen us all die. Um, I like so there was some like fiddling with this with the stakes, like we can't just not do it because we all will die if we don't. Like, and I've seen it; it's horrific. We all die, and we don't make it another twenty seven years. Whereas I felt like in the book, it was much more of like like heroic. It was like I can't, we can't let this happen again because look what it's doing to the town. Yeah. And its influence is just like killing so many people and killing children. And that's like why the Adrian Mellon thing has has like more of an effect because that's like that's why they have to come back to prevent stuff like that from happening. Right. Yeah. It did seem like everybody was much more reluctant, reluctant in this film. It seemed like there. I know everybody wanted to leave in the in the book as well, but it seemed like it was constantly like we're leaving, we're leaving, we're leaving. And I think that's realistic. You know what I mean? Like, truthfully, you would have trouble believing it, that this is really happening. And then if you did believe it, you still like, I mean, a lot of people would just say, like, fuck this, I'm out, <laughs> you know? Well, speaking so. of, and speaking of that, um, Mike calls all the losers. And yeah. I, I want to talk about Stan specifically. We'll talk about everybody a little bit, but Stan and... um how do you think that hit people who didn't know? You know what I mean? Because we knew because of the book. And like, I remember how it affected me right. in the book. But an audience member seeing Stan, maybe that was their favorite character from the first one and knowing that he, yeah. he doesn't make it much farther. It's it's interesting because they, they, I mean, it's kind of, we're jumping to the end, but we're in full spoilers here. They put a spin on it at the end mm-hmm. that I think makes it work a little better. But um, we both talked about how that was one of our favorite scenes in the book because it is, it is, so effectively written it's from the point of view of his wife coming to find him and she comes upon him and like the dread she feels that she realizes something's wrong and king just does a masterful job of putting you in her shoes and and showing the trauma of that moment 
and the reveal of you know what he scrawled on the wall. I don't know, like that is such an effective scene. Um, but it, in a way, I can see that maybe it's it that's an effective thing for the medium of fiction that you can't quite get because you can't get in the head, you can't quite get the feeling right, or it's a tall order to do that. Um, so it, it was it was okay. I, I I actually I liked it better than what we got in the miniseries, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Yeah, I mean, overall, I just thought it was okay, and then and then maybe slightly, I, I don't know. I guess I kind of liked the thing they did at the end with Stanley, saying that it was it was sort of a strategic move. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what was your thoughts on that, like that it was some sort of calculated thing by Stan. So I, I was going to say, barring barring the scene that we talked about from the book, I think that this actually made me care about it. because Stanley dying early on um in the book because it happened so early in the book we don't know young yeah. stanley all that much so i actually felt more affected by the fact that he dies after having seen all of stanley young in the first film and then knowing seeing him die and the way they wrap it i actually feel like i was a lot more sad about stanley dying and him not being there yeah. and whereas before in the in the in the book i felt like he was gone so early that i didn't really get to know him as an he adult dies before or, we even meet him as a child right so we so yeah. that's the thing is like he's already gone we already know all the way through and there's something, I don't know, there's something that I felt more connected to this time. D- did you end up doing research on if Stephen King added scenes to this, like that he wrote himself? I did find a little bit of that. I have found suggestions okay. that he made to the filmmaker, and we can talk about that when we get to it. Is it the Stanley stuff? Uh, um, I mean, I, from what I found, no. I, I didn't find okay. anything from... That from was one Stanley. of my thoughts. I was like, well, that would have been interesting if he came in and, and said that that's why Stanley did it. I yeah. thought that might have been an interesting thing I mean, for maybe, to convey, but um, it sounds like maybe that wasn't it. So I, I'll be curious to know. I, yeah, we can reveal it when we get to it, though. Yeah, and there's what, no way I could have found been. everything. So there is a possibility that there's somewhere out there that somebody's asked Stephen King and he said yes. Um, but from what yeah. I found, no. Uh, but I wanted to move down the, the different characters just to get everybody's reaction to Mike. Um, yeah. We got Bev, who who is kind of in the same situation. Okay, yeah. We have to re- talk about Tom Rogan in this, in this movie. Again... Right. To me, it's like the scene was effective. It shows that she's fallen back into the cycle of violence. Um, it's definitely dark. Um, did you feel like it had the same weight that it had in the novel and it had the same effect? No, but I, I don't think that they wanted to tell it really with as much. I don't think that they wanted right. to. I, I think in the way that the miniseries maybe um, shied away from some of it while trying to do it justice i think that this film realized like it we don't want to explore it we want there to there to be abuse maybe more from her father than from tom you know what i mean they, they were right. like instead of doing it from both angles they would rather just focus on her father and how he affected yeah. her throughout her life yeah we didn't get any inner cuts of of it being tom like when she was having her her moments of fear like it was never it was always the father right right so i i think that it was a it was it worked to show like what she was going with and i think the fake out uh, kind of got me for a second where he was like at first not upset and they sat down on the bed together and then he grabbed her wrist and like flipped like a switch. Yeah, I mean, I, and, and once again, like we, we talked about in the in the book, there was actually it was actually kind of anticlimactic because we have this whole thing where Tom is is coming for her and then it ends up kind of amounting to nothing. So I mm-hmm. can see like maybe that's why you omit it because like in the book, it doesn't really amount to much. Yeah. Um, other than getting... uh. Audra drawn into it, which is, you know, with Bill. And and that was a character that they didn't really involve either. So if you're going to choose to not involve either of those characters, then maybe you leave them both out. So we get Bill, who is working on a film, uh, an, an adaptation. He's the writer, an adaptation of, of one of his books that he's written. Um, and there's a cameo here. The director that comes down in the crane is uh, Peter Bogdanovich. Um, okay. Which is, he's a real life like legendary director. I'm not that familiar with him. One of his biggest one of his biggest films is The Last Picture Show, which I actually haven't seen, but I'm familiar with the name. And and he's like uh, apparently Muschietti is like a big fan, and so he was like he was like I want to get like a fantastic director to like basically tell Bill like your your ending suck and we need to figure something out. I love I love that sort of from a meta. So that's the first time we get the idea of that Bill Dimbro can't write endings. Mm-hmm. Did you know that that is a very common accusation leveled at Stephen King? Absolutely, yeah. And and yeah, I can understand why people say it. I think that he gets flack. I get, think he gets way more flack than he deserves for it. But right. I feel like for the most part, it's it's hard to write an ending for anything, period, ever. Ask anyone. So, Oh, yes. <laughs> I can totally attest to that as I struggle with endings all the time for my for my work. So yeah, it's tough. Like, I mean, it, it, 
I think that people point to to King and they see his productivity and they're like, oh man, he just cranks him out. He doesn't care how it ends. He just goes and goes and then ends. And I've seen uh, familiar things within Stephen King endings where I've seen like he kind of ends up in some of the same areas and some things feel like a Stephen King ending. I'm not yeah. one of the people who says he can't write an ending. I'm absolutely right. not that kind of a person. Well, what about what about this novel in particular? Because it's kind of a meta commentary about it. Because right. the ending of it in the book is fucking bonkers. Yeah, like it, it's cosm it's cosmological. There's a giant turtle. There's you know it's wild. But for and me- and then and then and then the way it comes back. Like a lot of people have criticisms of that. And then of course the Beverly scene, which is highly controversial. Once again, go listen to episode five of our podcast if you want to hear our thoughts on that. <laughs> um, there's a lot bound up in the ending that that a lot of people. There's a lot of uh, ammo for people who want to hurl you know that accusation at King for this project. Um, so I'm just curious how you feel, feel about that. Like, do you think that that's an accurate thing for them to sort of say, or is, is it lampshading by having it in the movie? I, I mean, it's clearly lampshading by having it in the movie, yeah. but I think that, um, for, for this one in particular, I don't really, uh, other than the Bev stuff, I don't really understand the criticism to this one. Cause I love how weird and like, I wanted them to get more cosmic with the film and, and I knew that they wouldn't go get, go there, go there and like really do it. But, uh, um, but they kind of did. A little I, bit. I gotta give them credit for it, man. They they got pretty weird at the end of this movie. Yeah, but not. <laughs> Which in I think it's gonna lose some people, honestly. Yeah, I, I, I do. I think it was a risk. Well, not in the same way. I don't think. I think not that, in the that, same way. Yeah, not in the same way. I, it, we didn't go like metaphysical, go into like a different multiverse, and like do all this crazy stuff. So it, it's like it's like that stuff. I was like, I'm in for like crazy, whatever weird shit. Um, the Bev stuff is like really the only thing at the, for the ending of this that I would point to to be like, what's going on here kind of uh but i like and like the town falls apart at the end of the book which like i think isn't that big of a stretch like whatever like i feel like that fits the story well and the more i think about it the more the idea that um because there's a couple things going on with this this novel and one of them is that we've i've already talked about like pennywise is haunting the entire town or possessing in like a demonic sense and so i like the idea of like the destruction that occurs in Derry. And like people die, like we talked, we we went through a lot of those scenes in our coverage. Like, there's crazy shit going on. There's reality bending stuff. There's people who are like, essentially speaking in tongues, but they're actually speaking with like Richie's voice that he used. Right. Um. You know, and like there's all this crazy stuff happening. Someone gets decapitated by a sewer uh drain thing, and uh, what's it called? Uh, the lid. <laughs> <laughs> sewer lid. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> Manhole cover. Manhole cover, yeah. Um, anyway, so crazy shit happens, and and when I was thinking about it, I was like, that is the ex- that is like the you know when you see an exorcism in a movie, that's like the body fighting against it. Like I don't want to have this demon out of me, so it's always really violent and crazy. And that's what mm-hmm. the town is doing there. It's it's the reaction of trying to have this demon exorcised from the entire town as it's doing battle. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's a really cool idea. And I it, maybe it's a tough thing to put in this movie. But I, I did kind of miss it. Yeah. So I wanted to I wanted to jump to uh, Ben Hanscom. Yeah, yeah. Let's keep it going. Uh, ben Hanscom's introduction is pretty cool because there's a fun a fun cameo. Have you heard about this one? Was it the bottle bottle of Talisker Storm he had sitting next to him? <laughs> and because I saw that cameo and was excited. No, I didn't even <laughs> Talisker that. again after Crowley had it in Good Omens. I'm it, Talisker's great, man. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. They've got good marketing. <laughs> uh, Okay, so the meeting starts. We're in an architecture firm. We're seeing somebody leading the meeting, and we uh-huh. uh, f- at first think that this might be might be grown up Ben Hanscom. Uh, yeah, that guy so looks is like the him. same actor yeah. who played Ben Hanscom in the nineteen nineties miniseries. The child. Oh, that's awesome. I love that they did yeah. that. He looked familiar, so that makes sense. Because I looked at, I was like, that guy looks really familiar. Why? Why does he look so familiar? That's right. why. That's and so funny. and so like we you know eventually we move to the move the camera to to the you know webcam or whatever and we see Ben Hanscom all handsome and and he's in his sweatpants and he's hanging out looking yeah. at the his little Beverly uh note from his yearbook and everything. I think that was a fun little nod there. I thought that was really yeah, cool that. to have him in there. That's cool. Uh and then I'm just going to rattle off a couple more. So Richie yeah. is a comedian and he's bombing uh yeah. after getting Which a phone perfect call from Mike. for a hater and and yeah. everything. It worked so well. I mean, I just Bill Hader is just like he's already my favorite person. And he just continues to be the <laughs> coolest cool. man and the nicest person. I love the like five o'clock shadow he has throughout, and he just looks like such a mess of a of a person. Like yeah. it works so well. 
Yeah. And then we get Eddie who is introduced on the phone and kind of like maybe like a connection to his, he's in like a luxury car, which could be kind of considered close to like the limo that he drove in the book. And in this moment, something interesting that happens is we see his wife who is played by uh, Molly Atkinson, who also okay. played his mother. So the same actress portrays the mother and the okay. wife of Eddie, which is like super funny because in the book and like all this stuff, it's like, well, in, in the in the miniseries, it, they did the same actor as well, right? Because it, it was supposed to be his mom. So what? Yeah, because like in in the in the miniseries, he was just living with his mom still, and she looked identical because right. it was you know they aged her up a little bit, but she looked basically exactly the same. So it's funny that they would do something similar, but then call it the wife. That's that's pretty funny. Yeah. So I thought that was great. Um, and then basically we we run up to all the all of them are introduced, and they all head to Derry, and we're we're basically onto the di- the dinner scene. It's interesting that like all of the analysis of that is completely left for the viewer to do because I feel like there was a lot made of it in the book where it was like them all realizing as they meet back up and stuff how much they all uh, reverted to things from their past. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. that the Eddie basically married his mother, that that uh, Bev is in another you know abusive relationship and like certain things like that. And then also like how successful they all are. There's a lot of this like magical thing surrounding this group. Um, and it's all centered on maybe the turtles influence and all this stuff that like all of that is basically omitted from the film as well. And I think it's worth mentioning. Yeah. I actually thought there would be a line thrown out because there, I think there was a line in the miniseries just where like Pennywise or somebody's like, how do you think you were so successful? And he's like, because of me. Mm, and yeah. like, I knew one day you'd I don't come think back we got any of that. something yeah. like that. I thought there'd be something similar, but we get this diner scene, which I feel like is a highlight. I love seeing the chemistry of all cool these characters scene. together. Just really fun. Uh, I mean, Richie's just cracking me up constantly. He's so funny. Yeah. Uh, when he did his Jabba impression, I I almost <laughs> died. I I thought it was the funniest. Really thing. good. Yeah, it's really good and a little bit inappropriate. You know, making fun of somebody and you know somebody's weight and all that. But that's how Richie is in the book, and it's it's perfect. Yeah, funny too. Apparently, he improvised that Jabba line. By the way, he like Muccietti. He was like, "Go for it, do something funny," and I guess he just like pulled out. Like literally, had already like studied the line and known how to say that's it, awesome. and like pulled it out and said it. Just <laughs> yeah, so I think fun. that's one of the impressions he 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 can do. Yeah, yeah, it's probably what it is. That's awesome. Yeah, it felt like an improvised thing. I have to know, like, just jumping ahead, just because I'm thinking about it. There's my favorite Bill Hader moment as an adult is when they're in the, they're in the the uh, the clubhouse and. He starts talking like Pennywise. Oh God, it was so good. <laughs> and what is that? He's, I can't remember exactly what he says, but he comes out and then he's like, "Isn't that what he used to say? You're all float." And then he does that dance and he like kind of did it. Yeah, like, and he made fun of the that dance. That had to have been improvised, right? It had to it was be. So yeah. funny. You can't write that. Yeah, that's like off the cuff. Yeah, and it seems like it's like it seems like something you would never write because it's like, oh, that's going to deflate the monster too much. You can't do that. Right. But it was so funny in the moment that it's like you have to leave. He it. nailed it when he did the dance and he was like, and he does a little dance and. <laughs> like he made the song and I, I was so funny to me i could not believe that uh so good so they're at the diner and they're having you know conversation about what's been going on who's married who's mm-hmm. not married the fortune cookies come out and we get yeah. kind of the fortune cookie scene and like all the yeah, creatures like a and remix things. of it slight reimagined but i liked yeah. it i also like the uh the the message that they were trying to decipher that was, was cool, really right? funny now was that from the book i feel like i remember that from the book I don't like the the think so. I guess Stanley couldn't cut it. Like I, th- I could have sworn that was like a line from the book. Because I think as soon as they crack it open, there's immediate. I think I think he might have written that or said that somewhere else. Okay, that Stanley couldn't cut it. Yeah, but I think not in this particular scene. It's, I think it's like they mixed a couple scenes together. And cool. and anyway, I thought it was really cool. It was like they they there was a couple of direct reproductions of what was in the book. Um, and then there was also just like whole new things. And I don't know. It was, mm. it was cool. Yeah, I like that. And uh, when when they're like fucking losing it, and Mike is like smashing the chair in the middle of the in the middle of yeah. the table, and the the waitress comes up, and they're like, "Check!" He's like, "Can we get the check, please?" Yeah, that was funny. It's oh, just... and then and then Bill Hader yelling at the kid as soon as yeah, they walked out. I love really that. Funny. What, what did he say? Like this is where the, the, this is where the fun begins, or the fun is, the fun's about to begin, or something. Yeah, the fun's about to begin. <laughs> and he's like, "Listen, Harry, fuck you, <laughs> 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 you little shit. What's going on?" Uh, yeah, so I love funny. that. And that that little skateboard kid actually becomes a pretty important part. Um, right, and that's some that's a kid from the book too, kind of. Although they they use them slightly differently in the film. Yeah. So around this time, uh, they kind of had the conversation. Uh, I think Bev calls the Urus residence and finds out that Stanley's dead, yeah. and she knew how he was dead, which is kind of that that payoff to that uh, foreshadowing moment. 
And then right. we get them all splitting up, going to the hotel. Everybody's trying to leave. But I like that the, 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 they they tried to lampshade it a little bit or like put some because remember that happens in the book. And we're like, why the fuck are they all splitting up? This is the stupidest thing. And the, in here, it's like uh, it's something to do with a ritual. It has to be that way is, is what Mike says. It's just enough to, to excuse it. Yeah, I always felt like it, even even in the book, in the in the it's ser- in the miniseries and now in this one, it still doesn't make any sense for them to split up. But I'm just like, OK, let's go along with it. Uh, I mean, if you just say, like, it has to be that way for the ritual, then they're like, right. okay, I guess. Right. So, <laughs> but but uh, in this moment, Mike convinces Bill to come with him because he wants to show him something. Um, and mm-hmm. so he brings him to the library and they go up into his, whatever, his bedroom area. And then he shows him yeah, the... Yeah, gives him some ayahuasca or something. <laughs> Dude, it's <laughs> it <seems> like... <laughs> crazy. I was really happy to see this, though. Like, I wanted to see it's this. It's the smoke hole. Yeah. It's the smoke hole scene. Yeah, I yeah, thought as it was much as so we can. cool. Yeah. Um, now, I don't necessarily know that I love, like, the, like, that they brought in, like, this little container and, like, did all that stuff. Um, yeah, and then, the, like, the tribe that, like, lives outside of the influence that he went and had this, like... Uh, yeah, it's, yeah. like, it's it's fine. I think I liked it more than I liked okay. what they tried to do with, with um, Pet Cemetery recently with the mm-hmm. in trying to explain it in the same way another project to be covered <laughs> yeah uh, yeah yeah i liked it more than that i think it was like it wasn't um i don't think disrespectful i think that it like it makes sense for the, this this thing to have always been there that it's they would a little been, bit like, of that it's funny because it's that cliche that like i feel like uh king fell into a lot early on in his work and it actually wasn't in this novel but then they kind of bring it in of the whole like uh magical person of color who's going to who has connections to the the arcane is going to be able to help me um and that is you know kind of happens here and it's just i don't know it's interesting that they well, kind of introduced the thing that he has gotten so much criticism for yeah. over time that actually wasn't really in this before <laughs> that's true yeah there was a little bit of native american stuff i feel like uh in this book but i think it was more like they dealt with it kind of in the same way didn't they like leave the area yeah, and and I I do think there that that the whole ritual thing I think was something that they researched that was tied to that. Yeah, that may be true. But uh, so anyway, the, I thought that it was really interesting, like like CG environment kind of showing the ritual being done before, and like all the the things that the container kept taking him through, and the trip that Bill had to go on. Thought it looked pretty cool. So then he's convinced because he's seen all this crazy shit now. The ritual of Chud is going to be, which I didn't expect it to be name dropped. Uh, the ritual yeah. of which is way different obviously than than what we get in the in the book but it was name dropped and it's now it's like you have to collect talismans from the past and i, I you couldn't I don't have know. a moment where where pennywise is like sending his tongue out at somebody and then someone just bites it <laughs> i thought i was i thought they were gonna, i thought it was still a good idea to do it like i know yeah. how ridiculous it's, it sounds, that doesn't happen like, in the books but that's what the ritual like initially is described as is the right. idea of you bite the the monster's tongue and then you have to like try and make it laugh or some some shit yeah like the description the original description of the ritual is really really weird yeah. Um, so then we kind of get the, we get to see the clubhouse, which I didn't think we the were going to see. The totems. You, sorry, I, I glossed over you saying that. Yeah. So in the movie, they have to each get a totem of their memories and stuff, which also kind of gives a reason for them to go do the things they're doing, which there's there's much less reason for it in the book. So I, I got to give points to the movie here that it, it, it really makes almost no sense in the book. It's like, why would they ever do this? <laughs> yeah. It, it's just because they were splitting up to do what? Like there was no really Nothing. reason. They just and I happened guess, to split up. They're like, oh, yeah. we'll meet up later. And they all just go their separate ways. It's really so they all They all split up and, and uh, we start to see them going to find their... Well, first we see them together in the clubhouse and we see Stanley's where he puts on like the shower caps and, and protect yeah. to protect against the uh, spiders. I really liked the clubhouse because the clubhouse was omitted from the original movie. That was a big part of the book. I was glad to see it come come around here. It was really cool. That's something we loved about the book. Um, and then there's a couple different scenes where they're all in there... And I thought that was an effective way to bring the children back into this movie and remind us of the magic of the children that that honestly, it's like it's kind of hurts because it's like, oh, man, those children really had a good chemistry with each other that you kind of miss out on. Um, And there's just something innocent about it. I have a bunch of stuff that we're going to talk about as we move into this individual tackling of Pennywise for each character. But uh, okay. first, I want to say that the barons like start to to slush and all this crazy water's coming out. And Henry Bowers is spit out. And we see a flashback of him being arrested for the murder of his dad and all this other stuff. Yeah. And then we flash to him in this institution and he sees a red balloon. And he starts freaking out and everybody gets yeah. all riled up. And then he gets sent to his room. And then Patrick Hockstetter shows his corpse crawls out from underneath and hands him a knife. Um, yep. Pretty creepy right stuff, book, I think. 
Yeah, pretty creepy. I think it's actually the other guy. I think it's like Barf or whatever that guy's name is. Uh, Belch. Belch, yeah. I think it's it might have been. I think book. it might have been like Belch inside, and then and then Pat Patrick. I think Patrick was the one driving the the car later. Something that like was that, right yeah. out of the book, which I yeah. which I thought was cool that they they did that nod. And, and I just briefly because I don't want to spend too much time on Henry, but I felt like Henry wasn't quite as scary as he was in the novel. Again, mm. however, I think they did a better job with him here than they did in the miniseries. Um, and that all that being said, I also felt like the performance was sort of a homage of the original henry performance like it felt more like it was evoking that than it was evoking the book in some ways and that's what a lot of the actors have said is like they're like i didn't study the book i didn't study any of this other stuff i studied the kids performance that came before me like a lot of these actors that were playing the older counterparts yeah. to the young kids like james ransone Ed, the guy who plays eddie older eddie mm-hmm. said he literally was just like i'm gonna do exactly what that kid is doing and that's gonna be my <laughs> performance uh that so- guy was that guy looked the best as far as like looking like an adult version of the original character and they even like i think they use that they realize that transition there's that scene where they do the face transition yeah because that looks like his fucking dad or something like i'm like I, those guys have to be related i don't think they are but i think a amazing. lot of these were like pretty spot on man like i think i think uh andy bean for stanley i think they looked exactly the same as well like i could oh see yeah the, that's true they could, you just don't see them as much but yeah right, you're yeah. right that one looked really good um and then, like, Isaiah Mustafa, who plays Mike, I thought looked yeah, very, very similar. Yeah, that's another good one. I, th- I think it's more that um, Jessica Chastain is not quite... I feel like... Uh, we Because t- we saw Amy Adams portray an older <laughs> an older Sophia Lewis in, uh, in Sharp Objects, another project we covered. And I felt like Amy Adams looked a little more like an adult version than Jessica Chastain did. I, I think I agree with you, yeah. I, I kind of see yeah. that, but I mean still great bad. for the role, Just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And James McAvoy, again, it's like he's got such an iconic face that you've seen in so much i don't know it was kind of hard for me to say like oh yeah that's that's an adult version of but that's going to happen with any like super famous actor i think right and bill Hader was mostly good finn wolfhart is finn wolfhard is that his name finn wolfhard yeah he's got like such a bone structure to him that honestly the only person who might be able to match that would be like benedict cumberbatch (laughs) yeah (laughs) like as much as it looked pretty good it's it's that's he's got such a like weird but like you know striking appearance and and i don't mean weird in a bad way like obviously it's worked very well for him right so uh yeah. very interesting cameo here i don't know if you're ready for this so we've talked i don't know how many times i think twice at least in our coverage when we first covered it and then when we covered the miniseries stephen king has shouted out Kuntz, right the other the other yeah. horror author of the time of the era he was the guard he was the guard yeah did he play the guard he played the guard Oh, that's amazing. Because, yeah, that's his, that's, uh, oh, wow. Okay. So that couldn't have been, either that wasn't a shot at him or that, or they've since come back and think it's funny now. Maybe. Either way. So apparently Koontz is like huge on, on dogs. Like he loves dogs. It's like a very well-known big thing. And he was the guard. Is that who was why like a dog sitting... ate him in the movie or in the, in, no. the, in the book? Oh, well, I don't know about that, but I guess. Remember the guy turns into a Doberman and kills him. Right. Well, the guy, so the, the guard that he actually plays is the one who's sitting and watching that dog video on his phone oh wow that's pretty cool man they probably have like have buried the hatchet now and are you know what i mean that's probably more what that is but i wonder if at the time it was it was a a shot at him in some way that's cool man i'm glad i'm I'm happy i know that now (laughs) yeah it's so cool i couldn't believe it i was like oh my god luke is gonna love this fact i love that that is awesome henry bowers ends up killing that other guard and like dropping him right in front of Koontz's feet and then like makes it out and gets in the car and drives off with patrick driving um the losers are all heading out on their own to to head out for their for their tokens or their talismans. And uh, Bev goes to her childhood home. We talked about it a little bit here, but I just want to talk about like, I, I guess you'd seen the scene. I hadn't seen it. So so it was like really, it really worked for me. I thought it was like, yeah, really like that, that, that actress who played the older woman when she does that freezing thing and she's just staring at her. Yeah. And then starts moving again. Uh, when she's like creeping around. Oh in the yeah, background. that's that's right out of the trailer. So I'm I'm glad you didn't see it. Then you were able to experience it. Yeah. So yeah, that's cool. The uh, she's like waving her. She's like standing in the background. You can see her, and then she just starts waving her arms and walking and walking away. And then the time she walks by naked, I was just like, holy shit, what is going on? All of that is in the trailer. Yeah. When she's naked. So, as well. so you can see why I was like, I was like, oh, like I love this, but I'm kind of sad I've seen it already. The, you know? the naked part as well was in the trailer. Yeah, really. Yeah, I wow. think they just blur it ever so slightly, but yeah. Wow. So yeah, that I thought um, that scene worked really well, and Jessica Chastain. I think that tension was really well held up, and and like I love yeah. the uh, 
the like giving her of the tea i thought we would kind of get the same scene from from the book where she's like drinking like sewer water or whatever it was and like freak out right um but yeah i think i think the token thing worked to get them separated but i think they lingered on each person's token a bit and i think that's where some of the some of the length of this starts to show is that every single person has to be introduced individually and then have them at the dinner and then send them off on their own to have their own adventure and then at the end they have to face it in their own way so we get all six stories or five stories or whatever three different times in the beginning middle and end you know it's interesting is we don't see mike having his moment um and i wonder if that's what was cut because i think he's the one in that scene um mike hanlon and i'm wondering if maybe they they changed that anyway um so back to that scene real quick before we move on from it the end of it is actually really interesting um and oh, that yeah. was not in the trailer and that is uh First off, I loved the sort of creature that she turns into. I thought it was really scary. This big, almost like hag, I mm-hmm. guess. I don't know. With like a really bizarre looking face. Very scary. And the lumbering creature that comes out of the darkness is is um, is, is terrifying. And, and I thought it was really well done. And then she, she runs away and then she sees this vision of uh, Pennywise without the makeup on, applying the makeup. Um, says some shit to her and then rips like rips his face open kind of to create the lines and does the laugh and just one of the coolest scars guard moments I think in this movie um, this one and then a couple others really stand out but this to me was it was definitely a standout yeah and getting to see him without the makeup and everything was fun because you know you only yeah. get that one time in the movie now did you think that revealed anything about Pennywise that we didn't know or is that added any, any, any wrinkles to it I don't really think so, because from what I understand now, from what we talked about last time, is that the Bob Gray stuff is kind of just another incarnation of Penny. Like, it's like another form yeah, of Pennywise. I think so. Yeah. I think so. I, it'll be interesting, because I feel like there's people who are reading into that, like, that, that that was Pennywise, but I don't know how you square that with what we hear from Mike, and that he learned that Pennywise came in a, in a meteor, and, and all that stuff, or came from the sky, and I don't know, like, I don't think you can square those two things. Since we're in full spoilers now, I have a lot of details that I can bring into this. Uh, okay. So, um, people have been asking Muschietti if he's going to do a prequel to it. Because, there, because you know how both of us feel about it, I'm sure. But people are asking for it because it would make money, I'm sure. So, sure. That, and the thing that surprised me, because as much as I don't really think that I want this, I don't want it. I don't think that it's a good idea to, <laughs> to take the material uh-huh. and go down that path. He's, he didn't rule it out. So he's basically saying he's not. I think it he's going to shoot a couple of prequel scenes. When we were talking earlier about the supercut, mm-hmm. I think we're going to get the fire. Like, well, maybe not the fire. I don't know because the fire, the black spot, kind of became Mike's backstory. But um, there's the shootout that I think there's actually a uh, momentary uh, Easter egg for, and that it's like a painting on the wall. They see there was the, there was the shootout. There was um, oh the axe murders that happened in the cabin. There's a few things like that, that if he wanted to go back and shoot these like quote unquote historical scenes, he could Mm -hmm. do. Yeah. So there has been scenes that were shot that were shot for, for it chapter one that people assumed would be in it chapter two, but they were not in it chapter two either. I've seen pictures. I've seen a photo of, of Pennywise. And basically there was another scene that I'm assuming is going to be in the supercut. And basically there is a woman who's running from Pennywise who's like not able to figure out a form because I guess it's like early days or whatever. He doesn't have a form that he likes. And he gets up to this this lady with her baby. And and then finally he's like, if you give me the baby, I'll, I'll stop chasing you forever and I'll eat and I'll, I won't go after any other kids or anything like this. And then I guess she like places the baby down and like leaves the area, like leaves the room or whatever. And there's like a scene of, of Pennywise eating a baby. Okay, wow. It was cut for it was cut for reasons that it was eating a baby and I don't know if they didn't want to go that dark or what. Too dark, yeah. And so, but if it, I guess there's a screenshot of him and it's like some sort of it's like Bill Skarsgård in completely red. He's completely red all the way on over and like there's no really makeup on him as much. He kind of looks like what you would think of like a typical Satan or devil looking okay. thing and um I'm not sure like how much you know that's that's from what people were reporting and then the picture i don't know it seems to be real but it could be fake uh but it sounds like there are hmm. some other scenes that have been shot and that would be like kind of prequely scenes like you were talking about um okay but i hope he rules out that that prequel i'm not really interested in and in like doing that yeah leave some mystery 
so yeah, after all that stuff happens, Bev uh, runs out and she's able to get away and she realizes the house was like all like dilapidated and what she was in like some sketchy Pennywise illusion thing. I don't think we've talked all that much about, I think I was listening to our coverages and like, I don't know that we really ever nailed down why, like what Pennywise was coming after, like what he was manipulating in Bev. And I think that it would just be fun to talk about it a little bit, just that this fear that she has and the blood and everything and what that represents is kind of like her maturity and like going through puberty yeah. and getting a period. Obviously pu- getting your first period. Right. Yeah. And so like mm-hmm. that, that like continues forward. And, and then there's also some new tones that are added here with like, her her dad and like he's like spraying perfume on her and like like there's clearly some yeah, sexual abuse going that was on there. Creepy scene, yeah. And so so I think that that like the implication now is that like her dad was sexually abusing her and like part of the stuff that she fears is like like becoming a woman and being afraid to talk to her abusive father about that kind of yeah. stuff. She had no one to talk to about it. I just don't think we ever really touched on that. I always thought that was something that that was worth talking about. Yeah, and and I was thinking about how. You know, we see her essentially as you often you see characters who don't have like a father figure. And so they're like searching for one where for her, she doesn't have a mother. And I think that's the absence of the mother and the like person she can take after and learn about what it means to be a woman. That absence um, is something that that greatly affects her character and informs her fears and and trying to learn all that through her abusive father, which is like impossible um, and having to learn it on her own, essentially. Um, yeah, that's all a big part of, of Bev, Bev's character. And um, I think mostly comes across in the film. Yeah. Uh, all right, let's move to Ben, who goes back to the school. And he has, has yeah. a flashback where he's looking at a projector and everybody's leaving class. He was sorry, he was sleeping. And then they, they like fucked with him on the way out. And, and uh, there's a turtle. We <laughs> you saw the turtle, right? I like saw, we get yeah. our, our, our t- turtle Easter egg for sure. Turtle Easter egg. Big old so, turtle on the desk. So there was also, I was looking and some I saw somebody say that like there was also within the frame, the way it was framed, there was like a, a globe like over top of it or like next to it. Oh. So it was almost like the world, you know, how the, he like oh, coughed okay. up the world kind of thing. Well, he's supposed to have vomited up the universe. Right. In the yeah, that's right. true. Yeah. 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 So and, and I like this scene because it's a it's a it's an inverse of what happened in the miniseries a little bit exactly we, uh, uh, it's it's child uh, Bev that transforms into mm-hmm. into Pennywise and I sort of saw it coming when I real when, at a certain point especially when she when she says something about like the you know I'd never date someone who's fat like you right. I even started to see it before that and that's because I you know I suspected having just seen the miniseries I'm like oh maybe he'll do it here I really liked the like flaming hair yeah. You know, you're, which is like the play on the poem and, yeah, and January using it embers. against him. Yeah. yeah, it was it was pretty cool. I I, I got to give it to him for that scene. In general, though, I do have to say there's two things that I think they leaned on a little too much in this movie. One of them was the poem. I think maybe just maybe just one too many recitations of it. Um, it, it just it was like a little a little too much of that. And then the other one is like I think there was a little bit too much of us going like, yeah, we're the losers. Yeah. That's what losers do. They losers stick together. Yeah. Like it, 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 there's maybe one or two too many where it starts to lose some of the effect and be kind of a little cheesy. I like what they're trying to do. Yeah, I agree. I like what they're trying to do and say, like, if you feel like you're a loser, just realize that like, it's not like, you know, you can embrace it and that kind of thing. But yeah, like yeah. you say, they did it a lot. So they do it a lot. They do both. I think both maybe one or two too, too many times. And, yeah. and the the poem like gets it gets said in its entirety. I think like four or t- five times in the movie. <laughs> yeah. Which is it maybe too much. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about when when Ben is running, he jumps into his locker, and then you know oh we get the, the the biggest locker ever. <laughs> yeah. Massive. <laughs> so, Cavernous locker. <laughs> so in that moment, uh, we get a pure '90s like callback to the miniseries when. Uh, he like he's he shows up it shows up in the locker and he's like kiss me fat boy that's yeah, 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 literally yeah. a direct line from tim curry's performance of of Pennywise. i did i did love how creepy that uh the smile of the i think it's the kids of the block or whatever yeah. like uh new kids on the block poster is and i thought we were going to get more of like a like a version of that smiling creepiness like coming to life me too like we saw with the painting in 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 chapter one right um i'm not necessarily sad we didn't but i thought that's where i was going because that was a really disturbing smile on that person's face like they they nailed it with that so once adult ben realizes like his talisman has been with him in the wallet and he like runs out of the out of the school he like runs into a janitor on the way out and that janitor yeah. was supposed to be a cameo by Guillermo del Toro. 
Really? Yeah, but I guess due to scheduling, they couldn't get him because uh, Guillermo del Toro is like a, is a mentor to Muccietti because uh, Muccietti wow. and him work together on Mama. Muccietti's film Mama. And that brings the connection to the to the scary stories to tell in the dark thing we just covered. So, yeah. um, speaking of, there's a lot more connections to other projects that we've covered coming up here, and and I'm excited to talk about them. <laughs> yeah. So I wonder if you caught all the ones I caught. We'll you see. Probably. Yeah, we'll see. So Richie goes to our, the arcade in the middle of town yeah. and he, he ends up at the park at one point but he's having this flashback of of being chased by the paul bunyan statue yeah um, that was cool and we have the flashback of him with with a young boy playing the uh playing street fighter and uh yeah and um that's when henry bauer shows up and we learn that it's like his cousin and th- so there's something implied within this richie stuff that i didn't realize until after the film i didn't it didn't it didn't uh, really? occur to me really um that i think that would that be he's closeted correct yeah but it's an interesting yeah. thing to, to to look at here because i have heard i've heard i'll ask you first how did you feel about it like how did you feel it was handled yeah it's interesting because it you know a change from the book it's a, an added wrinkle they decided to go with um they they imply that maybe he was sort of in love with eddie right um in in a, in a physical way mm-hmm. and and you know obviously at the end when he's carving the e on the on the board uh, we see that um and we see sort of like a it introduces sort of a repressed sexuality and then the way it's handled in the movie is kind of that it's this dirty secret in fact pennywise even says i know your dirty secret um and i don't know it's that's such a heavy thing to deal with it's tough for me to say that they dealt with it well because it was sort of almost throwaway. Like it was very, it, it felt almost tacked on. Mm-hmm. Um, but overall, I I also like I commend them for including uh you know a, a homosexual character in this movie. I think that that's something that was missing. Um, so ultimately, I was I was okay with it. Yeah. Um, didn't love or hate it. So I, like I said before, I didn't really understand, like, I didn't really realize that's what they were getting at. I thought, I thought that he was understanding and learning his bond with Eddie with the R plus E thing. Like, I clearly can know that that's typically like a stereo, like not stereotypical, but like a, a trope to do in like a love scenario is do the whatever yeah. plus. Well, I think it was whatever. even in a heart. Right. And so like, I, I just kind of, I, I don't know. I thought that it was him kind of like, like realizing how much Eddie meant to him. Whereas maybe before he was taking yeah. him for granted or something like that. But uh, well, and to it, get back it to recasts this stuff, their platonic friendship they had going on. So I can see maybe people being frustrated with that. Like, why can't they just be really close platonic friends? Why yeah. does it have to be that? Yeah. I, and I'm not saying I that know. I had a problem with it either. I, I actually, like you said, I commend them for doing that. I just didn't, I think that maybe it was just, it just blew right by me. Like, I, I don't know. I, I, I like in retrospect, yeah. I see that it's very clear. But it's like I wonder if there's any nods to fan shipping because I know that was a big thing for a lot of younger fans. Yeah, it was a lot of like shipping, like oh, I'm going to ship, uh, these you two. know, uh, these two together. Yeah. You know, whether it's Richie and 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 Eddie, or if it's Eddie and Stan, or whoever people would, were doing this sort of like yeah. shipping. So, well, uh, I don't know. Interestingly enough, about this, this is one of the moments where I found out that Stephen King. This is a Stephen King suggestion. Interesting. Okay. So he he felt that it was important. He felt that there were moments with like the Paul Bunyan statue, which is typically like you could see as like a statue that represents like masculinity or something and like right. being afraid and running away from this like giant muscular man or whatever. Um, and like Pennywise manipulating that and, and dealing with that and saying like, I know your dirty little secret. It's very clear to me now in hindsight, but for whatever reason, it, I, I, maybe it was just too subtle for me. I don't, I don't know. It blew right by yeah. me. Uh, you talk, you know, in the movie you didn't pick it up. In the movie I didn't pick up. I mean, I thought yeah. at the end when he was when he was scraping his name in, I was like, that's, I was like, that's that's like seemingly more than you would do for a platonic friend. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it didn't really like strike me as like, yeah. I, and I think that that's that's like at least they didn't go down the route of making him like a stereotypical like like you know what I mean. What what could have been seen as offensive or something like that. It was subtle enough to where yeah. it was just like, yeah. I think there was. I think it worked pretty well. I'm curious if that's something King had in the back of his head writing the book. I w- I would be interested to go back and read it, read some of those sections at least now, and and to see if I can like see some implications of that in yeah. the text because um, that could be something that T- King had in the back of his head. And, ma- and and talk about being overly subtle. Maybe that I just missed it in the book. I mean, they talk a lot about fucking each other's mothers also <laughs> yeah so it's like that true. maybe that was a part of what threw me as well like i don't know if that's yeah. like i don't know it just i, I don't did, know yeah 
So Eddie uh, goes to the drugstore where he used to pick up medicine and he has a flashback to, to like a time that Pennywise was showed, was showed up as a leper and like had his had his mom chained up or whatever. And yeah. uh, and then we get the kind of the same thing going on, except like he goes down into the into the basement area, opens the curtain, nothing's there. And then we get the jump scare of, of the leper being there and he pukes all over him, black stuff all over yeah. in his mouth and everything. Uh, and he leaves realizing that his his inhaler is his his t- uh, totem or his token. And uh, right. there's actually an, uh, an Andy Muschietti cameo in when he when young Eddie is walking up to the counter in the background, which I actually really? caught during my viewing. I was like, "Holy shit, that's oh, totally nice. Eddie! Uh, that's Andy Muschietti." That's I did not catch it. Cool. So uh, to speak to other cameos, we get uh, Bill going to a store where he sees yeah, his bike. Got to talk about that. And we see maybe the most famous or most obvious. Did you did you catch anybody in the scene cameo wise? <laughs> yeah, uh, Stephen King is the pawn shop owner, and uh, I just was I was delighted by this scene. Um, maybe someone could argue it takes you out of the movie a little bit, but uh, I loved it because. Um, I he was first off he's like one of the only person to do a main accent <laughs> in this entire movie, mm-hmm. um, and then second off, like you just know that that is those are exact quotes uh, of things that people have said to him in real like life, like three hundred bucks he, you can he, afford it kind of thing. Yeah, or, you can afford it. Yeah. You know, like you know oh, the big author now, like all that, like you know that stuff he gets all the time, and then the just the idea of like this is the author dream. The idea that you're going to have a cameo in your film and you're going to have a conversation with your iconic main character, like one of your most iconic main characters outside of maybe Jack Torrance, like, you know, that's that's really cool to yeah. see that. Well, almost like a, almost a character that represents him also. We've talked about it in the yeah, book. So it's like he's kind of talking kind of to a himself. self-insert character. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, so very, very cool. Love that scene. I would have been taken out of it, I think, if, if Stephen King wasn't a good actor, but he actually kind of fucking nailed it. Like, he actually kind of killed he's it. He's been in a lot of movies, <laughs> you know, little cameos and stuff. But, but normally it's not like this sort of acting scenario where he's like acting. He actually has to like hold up his own with like another actor or yeah. something. It's normally just like him saying a line or something. Yeah, true. I love that he's like, "Do you want me to sign the book?" And he's like, "No, I hated the third, the ending, and all that kind of thing." Like he was yeah, really in on that whole lamp shading the hell out of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so around this time, he uh, Bill leaves with a bike. He goes and he to the storm drain where Georgie dies, and he has a confrontation with Georgie. And I I want to say like the shots that they do into the this the drain where they have like part of Georgie's body blacked out and just his arms or Pennywise is like kind of covered yeah. in shadow. All those look so incredible on camera, yeah. and I know that they're probably augmented with CG and everything. But like, reminds those me are a little s- bit of the Babadook, the Babadook scenes. Well, I don't want to spoil that movie. Yeah. But there's a couple of parts in the in, toward the end of that movie where it looks kind of like that. Yeah, and those are just um, iconic at this point. Like those will go down as like the shots from these movies that people remember. The the and that reminds me of a, just just a set piece, but is one of my absolute favorite Pennywise moments in this entire film is the bleacher scene with the little girl goes under the bleachers encounters and she's chasing a firefly that then gets caught by these white gloves and all you see is the gloves right like clap together Mm -hmm. pulls it into the darkness and then out comes pennywise's face works so well in the trailer but like that scene is amazing and Mm -hmm. that that performance alone is like top three of like pennywise throughout any of the movies right so he's gonna blow away that like birthmark she has on her face oh yeah i'm gonna blow it away and the the counting to three and then the momentary like drool and and like like uh sort of that eye movement he does um the way he uses like pity at a uh, you know like oh i'm just like you no one likes to hang out with me with me and oh it's so good and and scary and like that's that's uh the iconic pennywise that we all know and love yeah <laughs> maybe we don't love but i love him <laughs> I, I thought it was incredible yeah i I'll, those are the scenes that will stick with me as those those creepy pennywise scenes yeah um, the way he's kind of bathed in red with such a cool look too. Mm-hmm. Well, it's like the using the firefly, yeah, using the firefly as as his like light source was so smart. Looked great. So around the time that Bill confronts Georgie in the drain, he gets like attacked by all those little baby arms and stuff. They're trying to pull him in, and he gets his totem, which is the boat that he made for Georgie. The kid with yep. the skateboard shows up, and he's like, "You got to stay away from this drain. Stay out of here." Did you notice that on the kid's skateboard is a faded pattern of the of the Overlook Hotel's carpet? no i didn't yeah. that's awesome so it's, i thought that <laughs> was it. really really cool yeah we also get another uh uh shining reference later when we get a uh here's johnny from from bev's father 
uh, which another project we covered. And it's really funny. Like, I'd love to talk about it a little more, but just like Stephen King not liking the adaptation of, of The Shining and like, but, and yet so many, a couple of those moments that are literally movie only moments and movie only yeah, things make it, make appearances in this movie and Stephen King's in this movie. So it's like, what is, how does he feel about that? Because he didn't. Yeah. He has to that. come around on it. So yeah. I'm sure he, he has. has. I think he's said as much now. Yeah. Bill goes back to the, to the hotel and like the skateboard comes down the steps and he realizes that he has to go after the kid to save the kid. Um, around this time. Henry Bauer shows up in the hotel and like stabs Eddie in the face with a knife and Eddie like yeah. goes behind the curtain and stabs him back which I thought was really really cool. Uh yeah, it was cool. And then we get uh Bill in the, in the carnival like in the fair or whatever it is and he goes through and he goes into the mirror area. We talked about it and and he realized the kids in danger. Right, the kids yeah. in danger. So he when when he's walking in and those swinging clowns are there, that that clown design is like based on on Penny uh, Pennywise from the nineteen nineties miniseries. Uh, oh, is that what it's it was? like? Okay, like it's like that. if you look at the it's the exact same thing that that Tim Curry okay. was wearing. Uh, so he goes through the mirrors. Eventually, can't get to the kid. He's banging on it, and it's like smashing his head into the glass, which I found to be really that was, unsettling. Uh, that was unsettling. And then yeah. the kid just blows up, and and like tons of blood flies everywhere because he just yeah. eats this kid. Uh, and second so, kid, kid just brutally murdered in this yeah. movie, <laughs> and he couldn't save yeah. that either of them. Uh, yeah, and it's an important moment because it shows like, oh, that that's that's his guilt is that he couldn't save his save his brother, and he can't save this child, and yeah. um, that brings that full circle. It does feel a little bit. Like we gotta have a funhouse scene and a because cl- he's a clown mm-hmm. and I don't know I'm 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 sort of torn on that whole part as much as like there are some cool parts to it I yeah guess. cool uh, moments and then this prompts Bill to go to the house on Ebold Street alone and alone yeah but they immediately catch up with him anyway they catch so up with him after going to the library and 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 like Richie kills Henry Bowers right before Mike is is stabbed oh, to yeah. death. Uh, which I will say, so that reminds me. There's a they a couple times in this movie. There's a character who gets stabbed in the back and then like does the whole like uh, and then falls over dead and then you revealed what happened to them. Mm. And that I, I'm just sick of that in movies. <laughs> like, can we do something else? Yeah, you know what I mean. Well, it's like the, the axe to the back of it was kind of cool because it's like, oh, you didn't expect that, but I don't know, man. I'm just I'm still just kind of tired of that <laughs> that cliche. Yeah. Well, I was. You know what I mean? Yeah. As we get further, I'll talk about this more. But like, how about when um when Eddie gets stabbed? And he's like still alive somehow, even though he's been stabbed fully through the exactly. torso for like a, yeah a long time. Two foot wide stinger has gone through his entire torso. Yeah, yeah. he lives for he lives for a while. <laughs> At the house on Niebolt Street, Stan's head is in the fridge. It rolls out and legs grow oh, out of it. Oh yes, and that you had to get that that was yeah. the thing reference, right? Yeah, it was. And, and but what he I, even says you got to be shitting me, right? Which is like an exact be, quote from you, the movie. Yeah, you got to be fucking kidding. Uh, you got to be fucking kidding yeah. me. Yeah. So good. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe they just referenced the thing in this movie, which is our project, like our next horror project we did after it. Like there's so much of this movie that felt like it was for us in a weird way. <laughs> yeah, it was so interesting. And uh, with the Pomeranian, with the not scary, scary and and not so scary door, very scary. Yeah. Uh, the Pomeranian like contorts and it kind of looks like the thing, like the dog thing creature that you see at the end of the thing. You know what I mean? You can see that it's like been mutated by the by the thing, oh, but yeah, it looks yeah. like a dog. It kind of looks like that as well. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does kind of look like that. You're right. Yeah. So they're going to yeah, the... that, that. That was that was funny slash definitely disturbing. So <laughs> I liked it, even though it didn't make a ton of sense at the time, but it was cool. Yeah. Uh, the other cool thing is with those doors in the first movie, the kids open the door and there's a torso hanging and this this woman's like torso is hanging and she's screaming and in this one when they open the same door that the legs are walking down so it's kind of like a callback to like the torso and the oh, legs I, didn't, I did not remember that uh but so yeah we we get the the kids go down into the hatch basically they go through the hatch after bev is kind of attacked by that crazy woman again the naked woman pulls her into the water yeah and they find they find like the the impact area that that Pennywise landed in and they do the ritual they do the ritual and uh I kind of thought that it was gonna work for a minute <laughs> did you because like there were I, I knew it couldn't work and I, I and, and uh, so so we got to talk about so there's the reveal of Pennywise as spider Pennywise which we had talked about like oh are we gonna get the spider in, in this movie I think you called it uh, what was your what was your thoughts on Sp- spider Pennywise so I understand why they did it. I think it was a good choice. I don't think that... So I think the scene was overly long. The scene with like P- mm. Spider Pennywise was around for a long time. And I don't think that... I think it kind of took away... So like, I, I don't know if it's like... 
I was expecting more. I, I know that it's the showdown and it's the end of this series here and they want it to be a, have a big ending and a big creature, all these moments, but it did. It felt like it went on for a long time. Um, but ultimately, I think the design and the idea to stick with Pennywise was smart because this movie has been so attached to Pennywise and to turn it yeah. into just some random alien looking thing wouldn't really you wouldn't have that connection with with the enemy with the evil enemy anymore. Um, so I think it was smart to go that route. I agree. I, you know, ultimately, I liked it. I, I think you're spot on. Maybe it was a little bit too much, too much of a good thing can can start to lessen it. Um, my my favorite part of it is actually when we see just the giant head of Pennywise, like peeking out at them from between the, the spines of that, whatever that was. And it, it's talking to them and like, oh, did you think that was going to work? Mm-hmm. Like, Mike, tell them about the real, what, like the thing you haven't told them. And like the taunting and like that was, I thought, really, really good. And then the reveal of the big old spider legs and shit where it was was nice and how it all fit the aesthetic of the of the Pennywise clown. It worked. Um, it, you know, I think it's some people might think it's a little silly, but like it's an homage to the book. And, and honestly, I think it looks better than what was described in the book, um, if that's possible, because you're just imagining it. But um, yeah, I think I think it mostly worked. I do think there was a couple times where it was going on too long. We see the the thing where there's like a tentacle like reach, 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 reaching out at them when they're trying to go through the doors. And it doesn't really make a lot of sense because it's like, is Pennywise creating these doors? And if so, like, why can't he make his tentacle a little bit longer? Right. Like, what is happening here? Like, does he really want to kill him or is he just fucking with him here? Right. I don't know. And some of that doesn't really hold up when you think about, like, logically what's happening, um, even though it was kind of fun. And then, uh, yeah, there's the moment where Pennywise is, like, looking at him from down and he can't get down into the hole they're in. And they have this, like, they talk to each other, a little powwow and make a plan. And then the idea is that Pennywise doesn't know it, whereas like Pennywise has otherwise known everything, it feels like. Mm-hmm. Um, so why in this moment is Pennywise sort of restricted and unable to to know what they're talking about? So there's just a couple parts that I felt like didn't quite hold up. But otherwise, it was uh, it was a pretty good uh, final scene, way better than anything we got in the miniseries mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and a well, decent approximation of what goes down in the book. Yeah. And I like that, like rather than only having to fight them, like each each member of the losers had to go fight their own demons, kind of. They had to like, uh, you know, Bev was locked in the in the in the bathroom stall and bathroom. Oh, yeah. Ben, and then the, the bin getting swallowed by the right. dirt and the way those two scenes interacted with each other. Yeah, was really cool. That was pretty I really cool. Liked I like that. that. Actually. And I like that she saves Ben. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a nice change from what we got in the first movie where, like, the guys had to rescue Bev. And ha- Oh, man, out. what about... Okay, so there's the other, the other reference. Uh, uh, Richie says, yippee ki mother... <laughs> and he gets lifted up in the air. Dude, that, that, by the, that by the was... the deadlights thing. I'm glad that you mentioned that because that moment was, like, really, really crazy. He was, like, going yeah. off and he's, like, sc- like, yelling at him, like, all that stuff. And then he just, like, boom, falls into, like, a trance, like, right away. I was like, holy shit, the deadlights are going to fucking killed richie this time yeah i just love that it was a it was a diehard reference yeah. man. i'm telling you so many references to things we've covered it's wild yeah um and then yeah i thought it was it was like dark and scary but also funny just really funny yeah. how it interrupted him and just lifted him up in the air and um i don't know so the deadlights was interesting what was your what was your thoughts on the use of the deadlights the the way they kind of explained them in this movie um that the, the deadlights were pennywise and then they just like i guess take forms um, I don't know. What did you think of all that? I kind of always felt like that was what I was getting out of it is like the deadlights were Pennywise. Like that was his, 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 like himself. That was everything that had to do with Pennywise. And then he could take a, a, whatever other form. And then we kind of see that with like, when, uh, you know, the vessel, whatever, whatever form you take, like you have to abide by that, the rules of that thing. So like the, mm-hmm. when, when the, he's be- becoming like depowered when they're like berating him. And then the deadlights are kind of like also being affected by that because that like represents him right there. Um, yeah. I don't know. I thought it was cool. I liked. I kind of. I really do like the the like gaping maw with like the the deadlights coming down, like the imagery of it like above them, and then also when he opens his mouth and there's like a almost like a cannon through his mouth with the deadlights on the other yeah. end. Uh, I thought that was all really creative and really cool looking. I still yeah. So it just from listening back to the old episodes, I had this whole theory about the deadlights. And I don't know if I was right on because I think you're kind of right and it is Pennywise, but I still like the idea that Pennywise is a being that collects souls and that the souls are represented by the balloons. Right. And that that's why he says, you'll come, you'll float too. Like, yeah, down here we all float. Like, I, I love the idea that he's collecting these souls to, like, keep with him in this space with the deadlights. Yeah. Um, to maybe just continue to feed on them or something. Right. Um, so I don't know. I'm going to go with my theory, even though I haven't really seen that anywhere else. Like anybody else say that they <laughs> they believe that. But I, I personally, that's my headcanon. I want to think that that's true. 
Yeah. So, I mean, basically just to wrap it here, Bill, uh, Bill con- confronts himself like a younger version of himself to kind of yeah. take the blame off of himself and say, you were a good brother. There's a weird moment where he realizes he's holding the puppet yeah. version. It's of like himself. Brother. Like he's been, he's always been like, like manipulating himself or whatever, like holding himself back kind of thing. Yeah. Or he's responsible. So like it's putting him in the shoes of Pennywise. Uh, and then, and then, like I said, they kind of berate him until he becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and can't do anything. And then they rip his heart out, and which they kill him. Yeah, metaphorically, I love that because we. I, I've been talking about how in the last couple episodes, like Pennywise is this representation of childhood trauma and how it can loom larger than life and can consume you as an adult and can ruin your or as a child it can ruin you. And uh, I, I do like the idea of like making it small to defeat it works thematically, like. Mm-hmm diminishing its power before you can finally de- de- defeat it. It, it it feels appropriate to me that that's the way it goes down yeah and i, I like that did you there was a thing that i was frustrated because i didn't catch what he said and i don't know if you'll be able to remember off the top of your head but there's like a final line that pennywise has and i think it's something about grown-ups oh yeah he's, what, he basically he said says? like you guys have grown so much or something like that Really, you guys have grown okay, so, so what do you what do you make of of of, of pennywise saying that i really don't know i think I think the filmmakers probably intended to just be like that was like the ultimate victory was like was like the kids have grown up and they they're not afraid of Pennywise anymore and like that's how you defeat him so he's like you guys have grown too much you don't fear me anymore and so I I don't have any power here huh yeah and then we get the ripping of the heart which is you know right out of the right out of the book and yeah I know it's cool to see it to put it put it back in there and mm-hmm. uh yeah I, I I'm it mostly worked for me and um I, I don't know I like that it got a little cosmic it got weird. Um, it's, it's larger than life and it's going to lose some people and you're going to look at it and say like, well, yeah, Kim, Stephen King doesn't know how to end things either. And you know, that's, you know, this, this being an example of people thinking it gets too crazy and, um, I can see all of that, but ultimately like you got to honor the source material. Too yeah. many people love it. And I felt like this was a way to reimagine it, but still honor it. In a yeah. Way. It's just a, it's a fun story. And like, if you follow it through and you let it take you, it's definitely long. Like there's no doubt about that, but I, I really was there wasn't any time where I was like not interested in what was going on. It was just it was you started to feel the length. Um, there are a couple of things that I did enjoy, like they they didn't lose their memories this time. They they kept their memories, which I always felt like was yes. part of the ending that was a was kind of bothered me because it, I like the idea of people growing and like and like having an experience to to, you know, shape the future from uh so I thought that that was a cool change that I really liked. Yeah. And the Stan stuff where Stan writes a letter to all of them before he died. Um weirdly at first when he started reading the letter i was like i kind of we couldn't believe it i was like oh this is weird and then and then it but ultimately like it worked and, and i think it helped wrap it and that image of all the kids like of all the adults standing and seeing the reflection and there were kids again and stan was yeah. there and eddie was there it just works and i, I like the 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 like camaraderie and like seeing the kids together and the chemistry they had yeah. and the story all together I, I i enjoyed it yeah and i like how uh when mike calls uh bill at the end and says oh if you you know finally figured out how to end you know end, end a novel or finish something and he says well i've just finished chapter one <laughs> yeah and i love that it's like it's like i'm on to the next thing i'm writing something new because that that totally is true for like king like yeah uh he's super productive so yeah. uh and and you know chapter ones are fun that's the beginning of something new and um i don't know i, I guess the writer and me loved that part too <laughs> like well, like the idea that yeah, whether or not I finish this right, I'm I'm onto something else now. <laughs> and you saw what Bill was was writing, right? It was it was like an actual chapter, like portion from it. Was it really? No, I didn't. I didn't get a chance. I, to read I think that. it was. I saw somebody had like somebody had like written it up online, and it was basically like the line where um, Eddie was talking to his mom or talking about his mom or something, and it was like something about like those are his friends, and his friends will always be there, and my always come back to my friends, that kind of thing. Oh, uh, so maybe the idea is that like this is the new, this is like a, a like a, almost like um, Bilbo writing Lord uh, Fellowship of the Ring or something, Lord of the Rings. Like maybe this is this is you know Bill Dimbro writing it that we then read in the like twisty way. I, I like that. It's fun. Yeah. Why not? And, and I like the scene at the end where they're on the water, the cleansing waters again, cleaning off. And like, that's like, oh, yeah. And then like, there's like the underwater, the underwater kiss, which like, I couldn't help but think like that is probably not the greatest kiss in the world. But I guess if you, uh, <laughs> yeah, I thought about <laughs> if that. If you've too. really been hurting for it, it must be, it's romantic, but it's just, <laughs> yeah. You're going to get a lot of, uh, nasty water in your mouth. And in the, <laughs> so in the first movie, they, they saw a turtle there. So maybe there's like some sort of connection to the turtle there. And, 
how yeah. it wraps it up. I thought there was going to be another mention of the turtle. Honestly, I was yeah. I was almost surprised when there wasn't. Yeah. All right, man, we got to wrap this thing. This is ended up being one of our probably one of our longest episodes. We'll see where it, where it, where it comes at the end of the edit. Um, but and you know what? It's appropriate. It's it's the end of it. It's. It's been a huge project for us. If you've made it this far, we thank you so much. We do want to go ahead and say we are going to be doing Arrival next, which is a very exciting project. It's something that we know we've, we've wanted to do for a long time. We're, we're actually going to get to do it now. And another cool thing is I'm going to be going to see Ted Chang uh, here in here in Portland. Uh, I think he's either doing a reading or a presentation or something. Um, so that should be super fun. I'll report back on the next episode of what that's like. And uh, definitely stay tuned for that. Um, we did want to thank one of our newest patrons, and that is Annie P. from the UK. So we an international patron. We're excited to have her along. Uh, thank you for being a patron. And if you wanted to find out how to become a patron yourself, go to patreon.com forward slash ink to film. Connect with us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, all those at ink to film. And join our council of inklings. We post polls and, and any sort of adaptation news we've, we've found. We've posted tons of it-related content over the years that we've had yeah, the council of inklings. Sure so definitely join that and, and uh, get involved with what's going on uh, moving forward. Yeah, and we'd love to hear feedback from you. If you want to send us an email, ink to film at gmail.com. What did you think of the movie? We'd like to hear it. We also wanted to thank Ross Bugden for use of our intro and outro music and Jennifer Delazana for providing our transcripts. All right, man, this wraps up it for for now yeah. officially. Uh, this is chapter two. It's, it's kind of very bittersweet, but I'm proud yeah. of what we've been able to accomplish with this project. And, and it was a lot of fun to cover. Yeah. And we, we hope that you guys all enjoyed this coverage as much as we did. We hope you got something out of it. Um, I, I know I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of people talking about our coverage online and uh, that seems to be it's a popular project for us. And um, I don't know, I just say I'm proud of it. And, and I hope that people enjoyed it. And this is the sort of thing I envisioned for this podcast, this kind of deep dive coverage into something. And I felt like we actually were able to capture it with with it. And, and, uh, you know, here we go, man, here's to the next one. Here's to the next big project for us. But uh, this has been a lot of fun. And until next time, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.